The Civil War movie has finally been released, and we just got back from the movie theater. I don't know. We got back like an hour ago, and we watched it, and there are going to be spoilers in this show. I won't spoil anything outright, but let me just say, uh, I guess this, this might be considered a technically a spoiler. It's not a plot point, but the film is very obviously anti-Trump, leftist, liberal perspective. And it's unsurprising. We'll go into greater detail uh, over uh, with that. I actually enjoyed the film, but it's because I actually uh, has have done conflict reporting. And what I'm finding is while I enjoyed elements of the movie because it is a movie about conflict reporting. Yeah, everybody else hated it. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes really liked it. And so when the corporate press is saying, you know what, this is a great movie. You can probably guess what that's what that means. I think there was a desperate attempt to try and de- liberalize the film at the last minute and we'll go over all of that we'll start with light on the spoilers only using public stuff and then move into more spoilers i know some people still want to see it but there's a lot of people online saying that they're going to spoil everything instantly because it was so bad no one should go see it so we'll talk about the film and uh the stuff behind it and then there's there's a i mean i gotta be honest it's a relatively slow news day but there is some news donald trump calls for defunding npr over their wokeness elon musk has received an inquiry from congress over his refusal to ban politicians in Brazil. So things are getting crazy. And then, of course, we didn't get into this the other day, but I really want to, especially considering the Civil War film. Costco is selling $200 million worth of gold every month. Now, why are people buying gold? We'll talk about that. And before we do, my friends, head over to castbrew.com and buy Cast Brew Coffee. Uh, it looks like, uh, nope, we're still sold out of the whole bean Appalachian Nights, but people love it. So definitely pick up uh, your Casper coffee if you want to support our work with our physical coffee house locations. I have bad news. I have bad news. We recently lost uh, Roberto Jr. and then Mr. Bocas. And the bad news is for all of those Rooster fans and Casper fans, Mr. Mutton Chops has finally been claimed. We knew that was going to happen because he kept escaping the uh, Chicken City. And today I saw him in the morning. We knew it was only a matter of time because the dude just did not want to be caged, but he lived free until the raccoon got him. And now he is no longer living because a raccoon got him. Uh, you can honor his memory by buying some Cast Brew coffee at castbrew.com or by going to timcast.com and clicking join us to become a member. As a member, you are honoring the memory of Mr. Mutton Chops, a rooster who would not stay caged, and you should embody the spirit of freedom that he brought to us by becoming a member. That's what we're all about. No, in, in all seriousness, you'll get access to our Discord server, network with like-minded individuals, and be able to submit questions while you watch the members-only uncensored show Monday through Thursday at 10 p.m. It is effectively an entirely other podcast, an hour long with call-ins from our members. So uh, that's the value you get. And as a member, you're supporting the show because without you as members, this show would not exist. So we uh, strongly uh, request memberships at TimCast.com to help us do the work that we do. Don't forget to also smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, and share the show with your friends. Joining us tonight to talk about this and a whole lot more is Simona Manjante. Hi, Tim. Thanks for inviting me and compliments for your accent. I mean, oh, I one tried. of the few that really pronounce it uh, the right way. <laughs> All right. I, 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 it probably wasn't perfect, but I'll take it. Uh, who are you? What do you do? Well, I'm Italian. I, I want to say that because the media portrayed me widely as a Russian spy. Uh, so I'm an <laughs> Italian citizen. Uh, I came to the United States uh, six years ago. I married uh, George Papadopoulos, who was involved with the Trump campaign, and that's why I moved to the United States. But before that, I was a legal advisor to the European uh, Parliament and uh, specialized in international law and child abduction. Then I always cultivated my passion for arts and uh, this switch, switch to acting as well. And uh, now I'm an investigative journalist in political documentaries. After I experienced it on my own skin, uh, the fake news, right? I became the fake news. So I said, let's merge these interests on a side uh, from investigative uh, journalism with cinema. And let's make it a product that is... Uh, enjoyable from a cinematic point of view. Well, right on. Thanks for hanging out. It should be fun. We got Chris Carr hanging out. Chris Carr, the executive editor at SCNR. That's scannernews.com. What's going on, Ian? Hey, man. Good to see you, dude. Likewise, uh, yeah. Ian Crossland, a musician and an actor. Happy to be here. I saw the movie also today, so I'm looking forward to talking about it a little bit as well. We also have Surge over here. Yes, it was uh, It was an interesting movie. I mean, I gave it 6.79. You gave it 4 point you something. Four. Four. I gave it 4. Right you on. gave it a 6.79? Yeah. It's like mid. No, that was like okay. Was I, 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 we'll, we'll get into it. Also, Fallout, uh, the show just came out, and oh, yeah. I am so miserably disappointed. Talk about that too, yeah. Oh man, I'm just gonna say it real quick. As a huge fan of the Fallout IP in the series, 
I knew it's been getting worse and worse. The easiest way to explain my disdain for the for the show is that I'm like, I turn on Amazon and there it's Fallout. Boom. The new show just dropped. And I tell my girlfriend, like, let's watch it. This is going to be awesome. And then I, I'm pausing every five seconds. back. OK, I have to explain this because she was like, what's that? Why is this happening? What does that mean? What is this? Why is that? And I'm like, wow, it's not a show. It's just them being like, remember Fallout? Remember the vaults? And my girlfriend's like, I have no idea what the story, what, what's happening in this show. Anyway, we'll get into it. But uh, let's jump into the, 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 big, the big news. Civil War, the film is out. Yes, my friends, there's literally nothing else happening in the world except for potentially World War III as a threat of attack from Iran is imminent, says uh, the White House. But, uh, you know, we're, we're more interested in movies. So we're going to talk about this instead. Here's a story from the New York Times. Civil War review. We have met the enemy. And it is us again. Rotten Tomatoes gives the film 83%. And uh, you can only guess what that means. Basically, everybody knows tomato meter is inverted. If, tomato meter is, if the tomato meter is good, it means the movie sucks. <laughs> and if the usually it's like the audience score will be high and the tomato meter will be bad. I have a feeling when the audience score drops for this film, it will be bad. But for those unfamiliar, this movie is about a team of journalists that are traveling on a road trip to make it to D.C. during... The Second American Civil War. And there's going to be spoilers in this segment, but we'll start a little bit light and show you uh, uh, before we get into it. But rest assured, within like five minutes, we're going full hardcore spoiler because of the political ramifications and the cultural significance of how a movie, and I'm going to outright say it, an anti-Trump film masquerading as not anti-Trump. How does a movie like this get made? What are the perspectives of people in industry and why why is this their worldview? I think that matters a whole lot. So we're going to spoil the film. And uh, if you want to see it, you know, that's that, that you've been warned. You may remember this. This is a map that was published on X. I don't know if it's the official map, but I believe it is. And this this came out around December and we talked about it. It's the A24 Civil War 2024 Divided America map. You can see here the Northwest and parts of the uh, Midwest are called the Western Forces. You have this strip to the center of the country called the Loyal Estates. You have the Deep South called the Florida Alliance. And then you have the Republic of California and the Second Republic of Texas. You can then see that Alaska and Hawaii are considered loyalist. However, A24 released an updated version of the map where you can see the Western forces became California and Texas. The new People's Army is the Pacific Northwest and parts of the Midwest. The Loyal Estates remain the same. Florida Alliance remains the same. But then you can see Alaska is polar bear cold state. And uh, that is significant. That, that, that is only somewhat slightly relevant to the film, but they they did seem to change it. So the first thing I want to say is, uh, and I'm trying to go slow with the spoilers because I don't want to just outright spoil everything, but anti-Trump film, uh, Trump is the bad guy. It's very obvious that Trump is the bad guy. The movie's not about Donald Trump or a civil war. It's about four journalists on a road trip. So understand that it's about four journalists on a road trip. And uh, these two maps, the reason I showed that first is because it appears the film. I think I think they were seeing all of the commentary online and they decided to change the film midway through th in editing to change the story out of fears. What they were producing was overtly partisan because it's it's I would say it's 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 partisan when you watch it. If you know anything about politics, heavy, heavy political influences, very obvious political influences and certainly a political perspective They're, They don't outright say it, but it is apparent. I think uh, in the trailers, you can hear them say the Western forces are approaching D.C. Well, back when this map came out, that meant Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, Right. And uh, the Dakotas. And then, of course, Minnesota is a, little, is a mixed bag and the Pacific Northwest. It's still largely right leaning. Now, the film is the Western forces are California and Texas, which makes very little sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there and let, you know, Ian and Serge chime in on this one a little bit, too. But uh, as a journalist watching a movie about journalists in conflict, what I really appreciate is how they captured the malice and depravity of journalists. It was it was absolutely and I, 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 I'm not being I'm not being cute when the journalists are smiling and laughing at the bloodshed and the gunshots and the gore. And one of the main characters is like, I have such a hard on for this. I'm like, this is what they do. 
This is what I witness when I'm on the ground being like, this is a, this is horrifying. People are, are being shot at. I can't believe these things are happening. Some people need to know about this. I'm watching these other journalists be like, what a great networking opportunity to meet other journalists. Man, were you there when this happened and this happened? And I'm like, these people are sick. So I actually really enjoyed it. But uh, I'm curious your, your guys' thoughts if you want to chime in before we go heavy on the spoilers. You want to lay into it, Serge? Um, I mean, <laughs> like, what, what was something you liked about the film? Wasn't you like I really the like film? the settings, the scenery. So I, when I look at a film, I look at there's the theme of the film, there's the plot, there's the there's the setting, and then there's like spectacle. This thing was spectacular in the sense that it, the beautiful settings, beautiful sceneries. Yeah. They're driving from New York to to Washington D.C. They go through America. You see all this beautiful, beautiful stuff, and that's about it. Um, I really liked some of the acting. A couple of the scenes I thought were really good, and there were a couple of really power. Well, there was one. In, the action scenes were intense. But I found it to be very, very thin on plot. I didn't. Mm. It was nothing. Yeah, we talked I found about that. Nothing to be happening in the movie. I was just I think, waiting uh, for something to happen. I think. I was the, like, when does this movie start? Like twenty minutes in. The 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 worst part is when uh, a Democrat governor uh, is 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 rappelling down from a building upside down and then kisses Kirsten Dunst. Yeah, that was. Beautiful. Mm. I'm kidding. I just stole that super chat from uh, Spider Man. <laughs> Deseret Rebel said, "Does Kirsten Dunst get an upside down kiss from Newsom at some point?" Uh, no, <laughs> she doesn't. Uh, yeah. Just, so, so what we're hearing from a lot of people online is that it was slow and boring. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, it was actually it was cathartic because there's like the basic premise is this like grizzled forty something year old journalist who's like really jaded meets this uh, young girl who like 23 year old who wants to be a journalist and then they end up tagging she ends up tagging along and she's like Ugh, why is this woman coming with her they they come to uh we're getting into spoiler territory they come to a gas station where looters have been strung up but are still alive and the uh, 23 year old doesn't take any pictures or do anything and then in the car starts breaking down and crying and kirsten dunce goes oh god she's crying and i was just like yes Oh, I know that feeling so much. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, like, do not. I, I have complained about it so often when companies would send me out to to urban conflict and they send you with these people who have literally no idea what's going on. And then they're just fumbling, tripping, causing problems. Uh, when I was in Venezuela, gunshots ring out like people are running and screaming. I run west from the crowd. The as I yell run to my crew, they don't follow me. And then I take cover behind concrete and they were, they, they went over, what, what, what's happening? And I was like, what? And they're like, what do you, what's going on? I'm like, did you see the national guard with rifles and the people running screaming? Um, and, and I was like, we're going back to the hotel. We're done. I'm not going out with you guys ever again. And they're like, what, why? And I'm like, I am not going to stand there as you guys stand in the line of fire and don't move. And that, and then I have, I have a human responsibility to save your life. If you do not have the experience to be in conflict, I am not going to go out with you. I will not condone this. You go do whatever you want. I'll do my thing. But yep. fortunately they accused me of being a spy and I had to flee the country well. by se seven in the morning. I think that was a plot hole for me. Like, why would they take that girl in the car in the first place? That's like a hard, they, you know, they, did, some they did explain rookie. it. No, 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 they did explain what, it. That he, that he, I, I'm about to spoil the entire movie. Just we're, so you know. we, do. Let's, let's, <laughs> let, let's start. We'll start with the hard politics before we get into heavy plot points. So, but the reason they bring this young girl, they reveal halfway through the film that the, the Florida based, like Latino guy was drunk and trying to have sex with her. Yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They made the guy, the weak, the beta, and they made the girl, the alpha. And then <laughs> I, I disagree with that. You, you the guy Kirsten Dunst was like the alpha of the no, movie. No, 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 way. no. She breaks so. down and she's falling on the ground right. and he's trying to drag her. And when there's in the distance, I, I look, I a lot of people are saying the movie was slow and boring and, and not worth seeing. I still think it's worth seeing because I think the movie is going to give some people perspectives on war and conflict yeah. that they wouldn't normally have thought about. Yeah, right. but uh, they're sitting like they're 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 camping out of their van and you can see tracer rounds flying through the air, and he's like let's go and she's like we're not going anywhere near that and and then he was like but come on you feel it right and she's like when the sun comes up and he's like i have such a hard on for these guns so yeah he was insane and depraved yeah they made him kind of look like a, bar a brute barbarian idiot alcoholic and then she was the one keeping it all together and the leader but then she breaks down part way through and then the young girl becomes the alpha well, those, all right all right uh... we've waited long enough boogaloo boys are directly in the film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boogaloo boys actually are depicted relatively well, in my opinion. Uh, 
Antifa is made reference to, but we don't know whether or not Antifa are mass murderers or were massacred. We don't know for sure. Yes. Uh, the president is Donald Trump and the heaviest spoiler of them all. I just said I wasn't going to do the heavy spoilers. So I'll, I'll save the big heavy spoilers. We'll start with the political stuff. <laughs> So I'll, I'll pause right there instead of doing. Were the, the Boogaloo's? Were the, were the Boogaloo boys really that they, well? They, they were they named. Did, yes, they weren't named. They, they weren't named, but they also. Oh, those are the Boogaloo boys. Yeah, yeah, but, but but what they did still, they weren't they weren't like the best light they could have been. No, I thought I thought they did a good job. Uh, what 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 makes you think they they depicted the Boogaloo boys poorly? Well, then if I say anything, then I spoil. As right. Well. Okay. Well, they spoil. they executed spoil. those soldiers after the after they had finished that that battle. They didn't need to do that, but I guess they just did it anyways. Uh. Fair point. Fair that's, point. That's, it wasn't. It wasn't cast them in an overly, overtly good light. They were still there. They were still doing things. They were making but, it look but be bad. I don't think. I I wouldn't look at them killing captives as mm -hmm. like malicious evil. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's war, and yeah, they're totally. not, and they're taking no prisoners. Still, totally. I agree. Yeah. I agree. That was that was fairly bad. They did. That, they didn't include that. You know what I mean? Yeah. But so one of the first scenes you encounter, and this is funny because I'm reading all the reviews and they're like, it's an apolitical film. And I was like, really? And then as <laughs> yeah. soon as they come across, so this is like, they're like, oh, there's shooting, let's go check it out. They're journalists and the Boogaloo, uh, they're, they don't, they never say Boogaloo boy. Uh, there are guys in Hawaiian shirts with armor and gear yeah, <laughs> shooting at soldiers, military. You can tell who they are. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I was just like, no way. I'm like, this is overtly political. They, 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 they're in uh, Pennsylvania when they come to a location where military, it appears to be military, have pinned down Boogaloo Boys. The Boogaloo Boys, I thought, were well in that uh, it, I think it represents like their combat, their, their people who train with guns. Yeah, totally. And they allow journalists to film. Yep. They're, they're, they're moderately like anarcho-libertarian types. And then uh, the, the scene is after the firefight, the uh, Boogaloo boys infiltrate the building with the press behind them and then enter the room and they hear a guy moaning and screaming as he's bleeding out and oh. then they capture and execute the remaining soldiers. Mm -hmm. He goes, yeah. no. Just hit him. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So I, well, the one thing I will say, uh, this movie was made by liberals who think yeah. they're neutral. There's not a single instance where they encounter any leftists. Nope. They encounter rednecks. They encounter racists. The president is Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. The the elite tactical force that that moves in to to take DC is <laughs> it's very it's, diverse. Yeah, it's very diverse, <laughs> and I don't want to be like a dick, but it's just like, look, man, you're, there's a, a lady Navy SEAL being deployed by a a powerful military faction to take to to the most po like. I don't believe currently in 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 the world. There is a high likelihood chance that they will have women deployed as special forces on the most high priority missions. Yeah, and I'm not trying not. to be a dick, but you no, know what I mean? Like, come on. Thin. No. She was a little thin girl. Like and, she wasn't a big, strong, bulking woman. Yeah. And she all. executes a negotiator. So I was kind of like, well, yeah, like biggest for me, I think the, the cheapest part of the movie after <laughs> all was said and done is that the president is in the White House <laughs> in the middle of a civil war. He's just sitting at his desk yeah. like he's not in a bunker. The administration's all just chilling at the White House. It's the dumbest I, writing I've seen in a long time. Who wrote that? Yeah, because uh, Bethesda and 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 um, Mount Washington. What is it? Mount? No, no, no. Mount Weather. Is it Mount right? Weather. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, come on. Like even the publicly known emergency bases are still under loyalist control, according mm -hmm. to this map. That was ridiculous. All right, uh, but now I'll give the big spoiler. Now that I've given you fair warning, uh, the movie starts with the Donald Trump character. And it's so obvious to Donald Trump for a variety of reasons. Nick Offerman is in the film for 15 seconds. No joke. He's got probably 20 seconds of total FaceTime and an additional like five seconds of voice voiceover time. Wild how, how little he's in the movie. I mean, maybe, maybe it's an exaggeration. I think the movie starts with maybe like 20 or 30 seconds of him talking. And then he gets maybe like 15 seconds at the very end. Mm -hmm. But it yeah. starts with him saying, we're on the verge of a great military victory. Some say the greatest military victory <laughs> in military history. And I'm like, we get it. It's Trump. The journalists yeah, say things obvious. like, you're going to DC. Are you crazy? They're, they treat us like the enemy there. You'll be shot on sight. And I'm like, oh my God, we get it. <laughs> and then you got these critics being like, it's totally apolitical. Of course, uh, when Trump becomes president, he'll launch airstrikes against American citizens, disband the FBI, and then kill journalists. Yeah, they say disb he disbanded the FBI. And had movie. three terms. There's as well. no drones in the movie. It's really, Zero. really poorly written. It, it, like they, it's like an idealistic 
movie from like because technically the movie's supposed to take place in like twenty years from now. If the main character was at some sort of Antifa, that's what she made her fame Antifa with, massacre. A, with an Antifa massacre. Yeah, they leave that in the US. You know which so side. So Kirsten Dunst's backstory is that when she was in college, she got an a quote epic photo of the Antifa massacre. So they're not taking any video. Nobody in the in the movie takes video. They all just snap still <laughs> photographs and no, there's no drone warfare at well, all. To be it's fair, like they can't really film anything. In a jet though. Or, two. or they can't no. they can't charge anything though, to be fair. But like, they don't have gonna... solar powered chargers. I've got like, four of them. No, 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 no. She still uses her phone in the movie. Yeah, yeah she's got That's her digital point. camera. And they say there's no service. There's no reference. There's only one reference to currency. And oh, it's yeah. only that US currency is worth little, but still still worth something. Uh there's no like the one thing I can say of this movie is that this guy was like, what if there's a civil war? I should talk to some journalists who cover war. And they went and found some like 60 year old guys who covered war 40 years ago. And one of the things we talked about this yesterday, I think they really missed the mark is they did not involve the international community with one iota. It was all insulated America. within this walled United States as if there was no outside influence. Like, dude, China would be the Western forces. Those uh, would have been no, Chinese I, I, forces. I somewhat disagree. You don't think so, man? Yeah, China, so they'd be all over take, the take, United take, States. So here's, here's what gets interesting, right? In the trailer, they say the Western forces are just outside of D.C. or whatever. And originally, the Western forces was the Pacific Northwest. In the new map they released, that's called the New People's Army. In the film, they call those Portland Maoists. Yeah, they mentioned Maoism. They mentioned Maoists. They, so when they make reference to that faction, though, it appears that they're saying communists take over the northwest of the United States. But I mean, and they say Maoist, so it sounds like Chinese influence. I, so think, I, I don't think it completely excluded. I think in a real, more realistic scenario, you'd have like Chinese jets and like uh, European tanks and things protecting the the capital. Why not drones? You'd have draws, tons and tons yeah, of drones. At that point, 20 years in the future, orbit, 20 years know? in the future, going the, the way we are right now, that'd be way bigger. Yeah, that's influence. kind of a 20 years in the future thing is kind of like a misstep on their part, I think. Because like, it seems like yeah. it takes place right now. It's it's definitely it taking place in the present. The movie, but without The movie takes technology. place in at least 2025. It's like when they make movies I mean, 2045, sorry, 2045. If you notice when they when they developed cell phones, 2006, they were making all these movies, but none of the characters had cell phones because they didn't understand like how, they didn't have the creativity to write that right. new tech and they couldn't have the, the, the suspense of like, how do I get my message to my person? Because I got to get to a pay phone and like in the yeah. Matrix. And it took them like a decade to catch up to how to start writing cell phones. And a lot of movies will be like, leave your cell phone before you enter become a character in our movie like they have to put their cell phone away before they enter the venue where the action takes place or stuff like that there was one early exception i think the departed was 2007 and they explicitly made cell phones act like weapons in that movie score says he said he wanted the because he he recognized the technology and how dangerous it could be and every character in that movie is like they're battling with cell phones that was that was a very early example but for the most part yeah you're right i think they're doing that with drones here i'd like to see a movie that understands drone warfare a little bit better the horror of like an artificial intelligence taking over like mm -hmm. one of these factions could have been an artificial intelligence that would have been well, cool. yeah. yes but if we're if you know th so this guy in 2020 starts writing a film called civil war and the conversation around a potential civil war in this country started a long time ago i mean first of all there was a civil war in this country but uh, it was like 2017 and 2018 people started talking about because of donald trump the potential for civil war yeah, and I, and I believe that a uh, part of it was to uh, not only predict something that is likely to happen, I think, much less than 30 years from now, but also in the same effort to, to delegitimize Donald Trump. I think right. it was like a sort of the immunity system in place. Uh, what if Donald Trump wins again the election? And it was written in uh, before, right, 2020. So uh, I think it's actual now as we are heading to 2024. But Already at the time, uh, the risk of Donald Trump being confirmed uh, as president of the United States was huge. So we have this uh, highly politicized, uh, overtly politicized uh, movie, which is not uh, like, uh, of course, they're making up that it's neutral. No, it's not. <laughs> you, you just mentioned how they uh, give the president as speaking exactly like Donald Trump. A journalist ecstatic about giving the most sensational news with like, uh, you know, like uh, vultures basically on the set and uh, this is a sad reality and the, and then all these minorities that are in the movie that just represent how they polarized america uh, playing this identity policy all over biden presidency like trying to put one against the other a uh, building up the idea of trump supporters like the white supremacists the racists uh, the people leading mm -hmm. america into this uh, polarization that they created by the way there is nothing of that existing. I'm a minority myself. I'm an immigrant. I never felt uh, emboldened by being put in a case. Actually, there is no bigger recognition than being treated as an equal, like uh, actually on the right side we do. 
Uh, but here we go, like this extremely polarized world heading to the de demon. They demonized Donald Trump. I think already in 2016, since 2016, all over his first presidency and up to now. So what more political than that? I remember when Trump got elected, he said something like right after he got elected about, I don't know if he said something racist or sexist. And then other people, it was like the floodgates were open. And then all these people started saying racist and sexist stuff online. And people were like, oh, white supremacy, oh no. And I don't know what, it was like he did give kind of a green light. Like, I'm going to speak derogatorily that means you can too because before that people just didn't talk like that at least not that's on TV. not true not in public <laughs> no not in public you would get well, maybe not a ostracized stage. this is an not internet, in politics this is an internet thing it has nothing to do with and, and but then i think the media a lot of people in the media blew it out of proportion and said like oh my god he's gonna cause a race war he's gonna be a dictator and yeah, they lied like, yeah and they made it seem like and, he was gonna cause some some sort of conflict and this and he is was like what i think this is the the, the thing about this film is that it's liberals going like, wow, what if Trump really does get reelected? He'll have a third term, he'll kill Americans, he'll kill journalists, and then the country will fall apart. And they call him a dictatorial president. It's very obviously Trump. And uh, I guess the final spoiler is, and I think it's fairly obvious based on the, it's like, if you watch the trailer, this is not a big spoiler, but they do kill him. Yeah, yeah, because he's sitting in the White House like an idiot. He should have been in a bunker. Like, is that come on. incitement? Is that incitement to kill the well, future president? I think I mean, like, you're, if, you're, if, the you're, if you're a far leftist, if you're Antifa and you watch that film, you're probably cheering the whole time. It's the first time. And it, if you love America, you are probably sitting there shocked and in disgust. It was, I was nauseated. It's the first time I've ever seen a movie where the U.S. president was a bad guy and gets killed on camera. I've never seen that. If you guys have seen a to movie, celebration and cheering of the of the main characters who are happy it's happening, it's like a predictive programming thing. Like, are you saying it's okay? Like, what are you what are you insinuating here, guys, with this movie? Well, you you know that all the Disney villains uh, back in the day were British, right? Uh mm. okay. That I didn't know all of. I didn't. All yeah, of them. and so is the director of this movie, by the way, British. British? Yeah, yeah, really? of course oh. he is. So what does he really know about American discourse? Oh, and the political okay. Life? You know, and well, it's it's funny because like they've the, people have asked him about like, isn't it? It's crazy that you have Texas and California like pairing up together. And his response is just like, no, they're they're pairing up against a fascist precedent. I mean, right. Putting two yeah. states, the, put their differences aside to when, defeat fascism. When you look at the original map, it was obvious it was meant to be like conservatives from the from the from Idaho, Utah and Montana and Wyoming. And then they changed it with the new map to Texas and and for some California. reason, and the best we could have come up with is because they wanted to make it seem nonpartisan that California and Texas could work together against the greater evil. Um, but I don't know if that's someone came in from the outside and they're like, "You guys, you can't don't make it the West versus the East. Just make it like the bad guy versus everybody else." Let, let, I want to stress that too. Like, you you get that movie, what's it, White House Down or whatever yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. And it's like all the movies that we have are the, the president is the good guy. The president is under attack. The Secret Service have to save him. In this movie, it's quite literally an external faction attacking the president and the Secret Service. And you are the characters you're supposed to be cheering for are happy it's happening. So it's quite literally like the United States is the bad guy. The president is the bad guy. And the president must be killed and stopped. And when they like in the end, they like. Man, I guess we spoiled enough of it already, so I'll just tell you. But right before they kill the president, the main one of the main characters says, "No, I need a quote." And then Nick Offerman's like, "Don't let them kill me." And he goes, "That'll do." And then they kill him. And it's just like so the like I felt like the bad guys won watching that film. Yeah. Like, like it, it it the movie to me felt like communists attacked the government and won. The movie to me is most likely on, on a probability line of the, the liberal view is that Trump gets elected. Tr uh, there's resistance and, and revolt and riot and stuff like that. Trump gets elected to a third term at some point to stop riots and rebellions or whatever uh, orders uh, airstrikes. In the beginning of the movie, a, a person carrying the American flag suicide bombs a bunch of people trying to get water from an aid truck. <laughs> That's really like good. it's very like it's 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 very subtly like if Trump wins, this is what he will do. He will kill journalists. He will kill you. His mm -hmm. supporters will do this. The journalists only ever encounter deranged, quote unquote, right winger types, uh, rednecks who are who are a holes and, and beating up looters and killing them yeah, or racists who are murdering minorities. Yep. And then in the end, they're like, 
the orders are to kill the president on site. That's what, in the movie they say that. A few things that I think it did well is that they captured how some people are just still living their lives as if it's just not going on. They're just going about their, their business in that some I parts of the country. That was pretty cool. And it also captured the chaos of the actual conflict when you don't know who's who. You get shot at, you're, you're just shooting back at whoever's shooting at you. And I think it also... Um, what were you saying, Serge? The, the, it really just it highlighted the horror, the absolute devastating horror of a, of a situation like that. But I don't even think it took it far enough because there was no foreign interference. Like we would just have the, the the UN would take over the country if we tried to. If if we the only reason we haven't been invaded is because of our national unity. So if that if we lose that, it's all it's all well, over. I disagree. It's because there's a gun behind every blade, blade of grass. That's a. I mean, it's a metaphor, but it, what would actually happen is China would go to West Coast states and say, "We'll provide any support you want. Have yes. fun." Tanks and things like that. Yeah, and they Strong. would say, "Thank you, comrade. Oh, yes. You're welcome." Right. Yeah. yeah. Anything to survive. Come right in. You know. Who so knows? you know, aside they're saying uh, Trump is the dictator, and everyone who supports him is a terrorist, is a redneck, is uh, everything bad is happening in America right now. They're building it up. To me, it's like sort of uh, making feel people who hates Trump and Trump supporter entitled to react in the worst way. And this is scary because it's going on. It's like a marketing massive machine to convince people that Trump is the monster uh, and, uh, you know, whoever supports him is a racist, uh, a bad person, the problem in America. Uh, and it's it's quite disturbing, no? It's a kind of mix between... Uh, Idiocracy, it was a parody. You remember this idiocracy? They really believe people are so mm -hmm. stupid to buy into all this uh, fake propaganda every each time. And now civil war, uh, that is like uh, their immunity system for what happens if Trump wins again. We should uh, rile up all the people we indoctrinated until now to cause some major issue. And um, the, you know, the fault will be Trump again. I, in the movie, they, they make it clear that the president ordered airstrikes on Americans. But I'm thinking about it now. I'm like, I'm pretty sure if Biden did that, Depending on who the Americans were, the left would still defend and cheer for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. 100%. If Biden ordered a drone strike on the criminal aliens invading the southern border, they'd call for his impeachment and removal right away. If Joe Biden ordered a drone strike on like a Proud Boys rally or something and a riot broke out, they'd be like, yeah, but they were violent insurrections. I, I would have agreed course. with you a year ago, but after this, the way he's just malfunctioned is the Israeli conflict, he has no support anywhere. Uh, if he did that, I think that the entire country, even his own cabinet would take him out, like, like get rid of him, like make him step down or like remove him from office if he was to do something like that. Maybe, but let's jump to the real world. So uh, outside of films, we have this from SCNR. Trump calls for NPR defunding after senior editor releases scathing op-ed, they are a liberal disinformation machine. And so we, are, we were just, uh, just now talking about a Hollywood film about a civil war. But this is another component of it's, it's fairly insane to try and parse through the news when it is all a lie intended to manipulate you into falling in line behind authoritarians. And so you had this, uh, uh, let me just read this, senior business editor, editor Yuri Berliner wrote in his op-ed that an open-minded, curious culture prevailed throughout the network early in his career. Those said NPR's direction in recent years didn't accurately reflect on America. Berliner noted the network overwhelmingly employed registered Democrats, noting not a single registered Republican was present at NPR's Washington headquarters. The senior editor went on to claim NPR's top network executives had pushed for the outlet to transition their messaging toward a consistently progressive liberal framing. There's a story. And we'll get into a second about a guy named Dexter Reed. Did you guys see this one? No. Mm -hmm. This is a guy who uh, reportedly opened fire on police, striking a police officer, shooting 11 times, and the police responded, killing him. I say reportedly because it's reported in the news. There's, there's video of the shots and the cops running and screaming and then, you know, them yelling shots fired and stuff like that. And the way the media frames it is they do not report that the guy opened fire on the, uh, on the police until the bottom of the story. Wow. So you Google this and it's all these news outlets being like black man shot shot at 96 times and they show a picture of him wearing his graduation robes. And I'm like, why not just show a picture of him wearing a t-shirt? Like why this graduation photo? It's all framing. So their goal is to effectively create another George Floyd scenario. The crazy thing is this guy who died, you know, I, I was watching the news the other day and there was like a shooting in Philadelphia happened and I was like, and? It's like, why is that news? Now they're like, police stopped a guy who opened fire on them and they shot him. And I'm like, how is that news? I was, I was night crawling in Chicago a few years ago and there was like seven murders in an hour. And, peop, and, and cops were shooting at guys. And I'm just like, 
How is this news? For some reason, these woke leftists in corp corporate press all got the memo. And maybe that's the case. So now you have this story with NPR where this guy's basically saying, yeah, Democrats took it over, turned it into a propaganda machine. Trump now says no more funding for NPR, a total scam. Here's what I love. Is NPR funded by the government? Well, they say, no, it's not. NPR doesn't get public funding. No, what happens is Congress authorizes funding for some secondary organization who then transfers funding to NPR, and that's how it operates. So uh, in line with the movie Civil War, where the president thinks journalists are the enemy, you, uh, you get the left likely very much going to push a similar narrative now with this. But uh, this is just a bigger component of what we already knew. I mean, this country is, I, I, do, I don't see how based on things like this, this country ever, com ever comes back fr from oblivion. Well, based on what? That the <laughs> media is intentionally lying to everybody. Yeah, there's and no the fact back. that Donald Trump says, make it stop, has them depicting him as a fascist who murders people in a film. I don't think there's any going back. People that want to go back, and that ain't the right way anyway. I just don't want to turn it into like, I don't want it to become like so passively fascist that people just don't exercise their free speech. That's what I'm concerned with. I want to maintain people's willingness to speak out against the powers that be because that's how innovation occurs. And that's why the United States is so great in the first place and why people came here and wanted to take it over is because we said, no, you're going to allow to say whatever you want. You can't come here and stop people from doing that. You know, at the same time, I agree with you, but we should be able also to call out lies from uh, newspaper and journals that uh, keep spreading a narrative that are totally baseless. And we have seen it with Donald Trump in many occasions, like uh, just spreading blatant lies. I mean, I feel, of course, involved into that because I've seen my character completely assassinated in the news just to get indirectly to Donald Trump, right? It was convenient to say at the time that one of his advisors married a Russian spy. That was completely so crazy that, you know, having the possibility to call out this outlet and even win a defamation lawsuit is now so remotely impossible just because attacking the fake news is like attacking the media. So, uh, you know, it's another type of uh, dictatorship on the other side. You know, we should respect, I agree, at a certain extent that could lie. You know, people should be free to talk and even say lie. But let's keep our freedom to object this lie, prove them wrong, and having, uh, you know, them correct their lies, which we don't have right now. Were you able to sue the, who was it that said you were a Russian spy? Well, many outlets, one was like medium with this uh, crazy guy that actually caved in a libel lawsuit uh, recently with another person involved in the Russia uh, hoax, uh, and uh, he won actually, and he was banned by ever publishing anything ever again. I'm not making his name not to make him famous here because it's like really like a fringe wannabe journalist. But, uh, you know, many other outlets picked up from uh, this, including, uh, you know, uh, the Observer and something, you know, just major outlets. And the point is not even like uh, um, corroborating what they say. It's just like uh, putting the headline in the front uh, to build up a narrative. It was never about me. It was just about the Donald Trump campaign uh, that was allegedly colluding with Russians. So I understand the feeling of Donald Trump calling out those liars. I understand you when you say we should limit our going after these people at a certain extent because we should protect freedom of speech, right? And I agree. But I think this is so normalized to lie against a political uh, opponent or political target that we should definitely be able to correct it. You know, we should shift back to some sort of accountability when you lie recklessly. And Donald Trump has been the target of all that. And people like me decide, you know, just uh, try to get to me, to get to his advisor, George, my husband at the time. And now look at the, uh, here we go again, 2024, uh, you know, the same mantra, Russia, 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 a white supremacist and a bunch of other things that are thrown there just to make up a narrative. There's like this uh, saying, look for forgiveness rather than for... Uh what is it? Rather permission? Than, permission, yeah. Go, ask Terrible. for forgiveness later rather than ask for permission first. Terrible. News organizations are, have been functioning like that and that they'll just print something that's that's wrong and then when they do, they'll be like, oh, it was wrong, sorry, we'll take it down. That's not it. It's, just, uh, uh, the news organizations will intentionally lie, make millions of dollars off the lie, then a wait a week, issue a retraction, and make a few thousand off the retraction. When they, when they run an article with ads on it, views are views. 
Doesn't matter. If, so they can they can run an article and just say a whole bunch of nonsense. And then if it's sensational and they make money off the ads, good. And then when someone's like, you better retract it, they go, okay. And they put up another article retracting it and make money off that too. But I'm with you. I mean, slander, libel, those are legitimate things. This new media environment where a random nobody can slander you. Yeah. like, And then a news uh, organization could pick it up and be like, well, I mean, we saw it there. So it's not like we made it up. Like, and then who do you sue in that case? Exactly. Technically, the loudest mouth, I think, is usually the one that gets the lawsuit. But then they, what do they pin it on their sources and be like, well, we just got it from that small outlet. What do you know how that works? Well, mm. that's that's how they do. That's a vicious machine, you know, like so I read it there. So I picked up this article. I don't have to justify why <laughs> actually they're uh, proposing the same content. You should go to the source and then prove. And then when you have you are a public person in a certain way, you have much less protection on your side. So legislation should change a little bit. But on the micro picture, macro picture, I believe Donald Trump. When I read these uh, truths, I thought I relate to because think about this uh, man. It's he has a machine of the ju judicial machine from his side, and then you have the media machine colluding to create the same narrative. So he has thousand indictments. Think about Jane Carroll, like based on, uh, you know, baseless allegation again and media covering it in a certain way. And here we go. The narrative is built upon like everybody's trying one thing to avoid Donald Trump to win the election again. And that's that's a fact or delegitimize him once he's in power. And everybody can see that even liberals, you know, uh, have you ever seen so many forces against one man and why? <laughs> not yeah. in American politics. Not mm -hmm. like this, no. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and you can even try to attack the corporate press. I mean, even if you're Trump, you know, I mean, he just sued George Stephanop uh, George Stephanopoulos for lying about him on air. Who knows where that that's going to go? You know, I mean, and it's anybody's guess once it gets into the topsy-turvy legal system, pretty much anything can happen, I think. Even if you're Donald Trump and can afford the best lawyers possible. I'm not too familiar with NPR. It's, it's called National Public Radio, but it's a pri privately funded yeah, well, um, part of what happened here, according to this guy's op-ed, is that uh, things changed when a, uh, a guy named John Lansing took over as CEO in 2019. And then when the summer of George Floyd happened, the top-down edict was, we have to get at this systemic racism problem. I mean, the, and then <clears throat> from there, from there, it was just framed that way moving forward. And then everybody else had to fall in line. And I imagine that's pretty much what happens in most of these corporate press newsrooms. It comes from, you know, some deranged CEO that takes over and has, you know, uh, kind of goofy ideological views on things and they just mandate it top down. Maybe it should, when Trump's uh, lawsuit should, he should just sue them and make them take national out of their, out of their title because they're not. <laughs> That's a brand name. Yeah. Like get, calling, like if I call my company uh, the federal Armory. Express. Yeah, if I yeah, Federal Express <laughs> they had to change it to FedEx because federal it wasn't federal. Yeah. And like if I call my thing like the this the if I call my company like the legitimate American government or or like people be like, well it's not. You can't like call your private company. So there's certain things like or if I'm like uh wanna call it. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Like um the United States Congress. Like yeah, if I want to make not. a company and call it the United <laughs> States Congress, they'd say no, you can't name it. So calling it the national, it's not national, it's a private I I would love to get their stock. That's um, a very good point. Who owns the company? It's owned by National Public Radio Inc. And who owns that? And uh, where the stock all comes from? Because I read about it a couple of years ago, and I don't have the data here, but I remember seeing that only a little bit of money comes from the government, and all the rest was coming from private organizations. Here's, I, 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 where, do, where, do, where did you hear yeah. that they changed their name from Federal Express because they were they were forced oh, to? Oh, I just I just remember them changing it to FedEx. Yeah, they weren't forced to do it. You're allowed to say federal. They just oh. branded, they created a brand. They name. called it the Federal Reserve, and it wasn't even a, a federal uh, organization. So uh, it is pretty deceptive to call your company federal if it's not federal and call it national public something if it's a private you know, company that's kind of crazy. I, I just got to get the stock. I didn't know we were going to go too deep into this just now. Uh, let's see, privately supported. Yeah, National Public Radio is a privately supported, not for profit organization that produces. Yeah, privately incentives. supported by who? So 900. Um, uh, let's see, I'm already including my 900. Oh, what were you going to say? Yeah, who, who gives them the money? I'm going for it. I'm looking. Congress funds some like program, which then provides the funding to NPR. So it says it's. NPR is funded through private donations, member station dues, and grants from organizations such as the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the National Science Foundation. So now the question is, how much of their money comes from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting? Yeah, that is a good one. And then how much does Congress give to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting? Mm -hmm. Dude, conservatives, man, 
they just sit back and they let Democrats funnel tax dollars into things like universities and the press so that they could be infiltrated by communists. And now here we are. But My parents, I, I remember talking to them a couple of years ago and they're like, well, NPR's uh, government wet news. I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're supposed That's what they want you to think, I, I believe. That's why they call it that. Hmm. Well, we'll come back to whatever that is. Let's talk about this Nicolay Mew story. Did you guys hear this one? Mm -hmm. This is the uh, huge implications for uh, self-defense. This guy, Nicolay Mew, was, uh, I watched the video. He's in a river. He's attacked by a bunch of teens. He defends himself. And now he's found guilty of, uh, they say, first degree homicide of Boy 17 during a tubing trip after a gang of teens accuse him of being a pedophile. So th there's a lot to this story, but the general, the, the gist is there's a video showing him walking around in about, you know, six inches to a foot of water while they're tubing, stumbles over, falls over, drops a snorkel. The kids all start surrounding him, screaming at him, teenagers, yelling. One dude yells for the culture several times. Someone, some woman comes up and shoves him. He then grabs a folding knife that he was using for tubing. Someone then shoves him to the, to, the, to the ground. He hits the ground. Then someone smacks him in the face. Then as he's getting up, the boy who died jumps at him. And when he does, Mew pushes back with the knife and with his hand. And the knife goes into his gut. And that was basically the killing blow. He then has continued to be attacked and slashes a few others. They found him guilty of this. And, and a lot of people are saying it's a travesty of justice when you watch the video. Because this guy never said anything to these kids. His mouth is shut. He's calm. He's not threatening anybody. They surround him screaming at him and then attack him several times. And now he's been found guilty. Um, so I think Carter, oh, did Carter Banks, was he talking about this? He said that about the, guy, the Apple Valley guy. Yeah. Mm. Or Apple River. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mentioned that he thought that the so guy had is... been lying to the police. Is that true? Yeah. So one of the things is that people were saying that he folded the knife and threw it on the riverbed or something. So, he, mm -hmm. okay. Right. So, which was like intent to withhold evidence or something. But the thing is, in, you can die in a foot of, you can drown in a foot of water. If he fell and hit his head, he would have, could have died. I don't care if he was on grass or otherwise. You attack someone and smack him in the face and try to stop him from getting up. It's reasonable for someone to think I'm surrounded by people. They're trying to kill me. And if me. someone's got a knife on them, they might think they're going to take my knife and kill me with it if I don't Absolutely. stop them. That's another huge component of, of self-defense. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. They always say the defense should be proportionate to the offense. But when I have a gang, a, a bunch of people coming at you, uh, where is the line between proportion? You know, like uh, you have to use the, what, what you have to just uh, save yourself. The entire point is save your, your life. Are you using... Are you using uh, a proportionate force to do that or means on everything else but here uh it's always the same point to me where is law enforcement uh, right there are pending accusation uh, toward these guys so usually when you go through a legal proceeding to know if you're guilty or uh, innocent you should have law enforcement in place to take care of the situation but when people come and get you because they heard uh, this accusation of uh, pedophilia uh then you know the the, the balance is like we are allowing people it, it, to get over but yeah they made they it, it appears they made that up i mean mm -hmm. i, I yeah. don't see like what, what the guy yeah. apparently was looking for a phone that he dropped in the river and and it, so they they end up starting a fight with him they lost and so then all of a sudden he's accused of being a pedo so they just made it up too yeah no that, that's crazy yeah, it that's seemed like crazy. it was just a deranged insult that they hurled at him and i mean his attorney said that they punched him they kicked him they did it repeatedly they pushed him it's on video yeah i mean like it, now he's facing 60 years. For first degree reckless homicide and four other charges of um, four counts of attempted intentional first degree homicide. So that's because he swung the knife at four other people. First degree intentional homicide. Intentional. That's that that that's amazing. Yeah, that's They're basically really saying he great. walked over there intending to kill people. Did he lunge at the guy or the guy lunged at him? The guy lunged at him. Not like you watch the video. The dude jumps at him, and then he has his hand with the knife and his hand like this, and he, and he pushes as the guy's jumping at him, and that's how the guy got stabbed. <laughs> he didn't advance on the guy. The guy advanced on him. That's crazy. And it was like mm -hmm. eight days ago. That's a really quick trial. That's it's, really crazy. No, it was two, no, it's happened in 20, oh, 2022. Oh, it was two years yeah. ago? Yeah. I just heard about it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very confused. about. It. I've heard someone told me that it was a very emotional courtroom. Was that Carter also? He made a few comments about I it. I don't know. I'm just... It's very obvious the direction of things, and I wonder if the you know, Sultanitsyn story about how policing operates is just domino. It's dominoes falling over. No matter what you do, when you get a society like this, it will always tend towards the path of least resistance. That is, 
with like George Floyd, the police are, or Ahmed Arbery is a really good example. The cops are like, we don't care if these guys are guilty or not guilty. We just don't want to deal with it. So mm-hmm. lock them up for the rest of their lives. And that's the, that was the point of the constitution to prevent things like this. But uh, this is what you get. I mean, you look at the story uh, Doug Mackey was telling us. Uh, he gets found guilty for posting a meme he found on the internet. He, he, he just tweeted it. He found a meme, he's a ha and he tweeted it out. And then they're like, now you're going to jail for election fraud or whatever, mm-hmm. injuring people. And it's like, how did the jurors find him guilty? He was saying that they were too, the, the jury was hung twice and the judge said, nope, go back. Go, you have to go back. And it's like, finally, what happens is, you know, they went back and the people who are like, he's guilty said, just say he's guilty so we can leave. And they went, fine. Mm-hmm. It's so brutal. If I was there, I'd be like, no, you say he's not guilty and we can leave. You want to go home? You say not guilty. Mm-hmm. But this is what we get yeah. right now. Jurors don't want to do jury duty. A jury duty. And also, I'm, I'm just you're scared as, uh, as a woman mostly to knowing that the police is afraid to intervene if somebody's attacking you, right? Because uh, there are so much limit. You think about George Floyd and all other cases. Uh, they're always getting to the police for overpower their force. Uh, are always on the other side. Uh, criminals are let free. I see in California, for example, this is this crazy law that you can steal up to the value of $1,000, right? So you have this gang of people going into the Gucci store and st- stealing bags and then just uh, you see the security looking at them not even bothering calling police because there is nothing you can do and this is a completely crazy society let's be realistic where uh, this police is afraid to intervene because they're going to have issues themselves they probably end up it's more likely they end up going to jail than the criminal you're calling the police against so how how can you afford that in the long term you have uh, you have cities, big cities, full of criminals, and the police that is uh, basically not interested in to intervene anymore. Why would you do that? Why would I do for my low salary, risk my life at the time, and then knowing that uh, probably the jury will tell me that I've been violent, I've been racist, if, uh, I don't know, if the other on the other side you happens to have a, a person of color or anything else, a minority group. It's, it's just crazy. This is the other side of... Uh, indoctrination this is the other uh, issue you have when uh, you know you build up this entire narrative that uh, some categories must be protected uh, even if they're criminals right you are scared to intervene you can't do anything about it what they would call like anarcho tyranny mm. tyranny of the majority yeah. worst of both yeah yeah because like people are so afraid of or have been of the cops and, and police violence that it's swung in the other direction like they were so concerned with government overreach that there are now crowds of people storming and seizing and taking a bridge and holding, was it the Golden Gate in San Francisco? Or was that Golden Gate? They just seized, Yes, yeah. They, they took control of a bridge and like block, like that's that's like they conquered a bridge or at least they held a bridge for time. Should have, cops should have been there. They should have been there with fire hoses as far as I'm concerned. I don't know. Can't, Dude, can't the, the, the video's wild. I mean, they're all laughing. And la- they, they shove him to the ground, smack him in the face, Try to push him down again, and they're all laughing as they're doing it. And the and the argument's supposed to be that he was threatening them because he 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 ran up to them, and it's like he didn't say anything to him. Did he? Is there like did he before the video? Is that what happened? Nope. Before the video, he harassed them, and then they. There's just which chance a normal person would go after a gang and um, you know start a fight? Mm-hmm. I mean, itself uh, is would be suicidal. You know, I don't believe that. But he did lie to the cops right after it happened. If he if he felt like he was justified. Yeah, yeah, it, exactly. It, it, like just like Daniel Daniel Penny, you know, very very good for him to to surrender and. It's true. And, Some I, people like turn themselves in, and then they are the ones that end up getting arrested. Like that every whole time fighting when the Antifa and the, and the Proud Boys Proud in, Boys in New fought. York. That's exactly Proud what's going to happen. Stayed to talk so to I'm, the cops and got I'm, the... I'm not surprised. We're at a point where a guy's like, I'm I, I defended myself, but now the cops are going to lock me up forever. Mm-hmm. Welcome to uh, the Gulag uh, Archipelago. Really? I don't think it's that bad. That's the story that Solzhenitsyn wrote. Yeah, yeah. That when the guy was trying to kill the soldier, the soldier defended himself, so he went to jail. You're like, this is it. You're not allowed to defend yourself. These, the, like, you know, the, the, we got a super chat. What did, what did Sonny G says? You need to hear the whole story. The man hit the girl in the face first, and the teen boys drunk inter, uh, intervened. That man gutted them all. So they're Why saying were that- they surrounding him and screaming at him and all yelling for the culture and for the culture? So I can't speak for Wisconsin, but in Illinois, that's assault. The, in, in, so in, not in every state. In New York, assault requires physical damage, meaning in New York, if someone grabs you, there's no crime committed. 
In Illinois, if someone lunges at you, they've committed assault. If they touch you in any way, it's battery, let alone if they injure you. So it's very different. So in Illinois, I can't, again, so can't be for this is Wisconsin. If a bunch of people surround you screaming and pointing their hands at you, screaming in your face, insulting you and yelling for the culture, yeah, you're allowed to defend yourself. Granted, you're not allowed to defend yourself with any kind of weapon or anything in Illinois. They'll, they'll lock you up for having a rubber switch. Or actually, I think it's the only one you're allowed to have. So the the uh, with off of that uh, comment that we got, Dante Carlson was the the witness that was there. He said he initially told police that he saw Mew hit another woman, but then he changed his story before trial. So that was right. an early yeah. That's what but he said it, it, initially. It's on it's on changed. video. You see the woman shove him. Yeah. The guy Nick Mew is just standing there, and then she shoves him, and he fall. When he does, that's when he grabs the folding knife from his pocket and flips it out. So there he then told- they shove him to the shove him to the ground. He falls down. They smack him in the face. And the dude who died then jumps at him to knock him back down as he's getting up. And you watch the video. The Mew just has his, has the knife in his hand like this, and he, and he goes like that. He didn't lunge at anybody. And then as they're all screaming and surrounding him, he does start slashing he's or whatever. Swinging. Did, so you're saying Mew told the police he no, punched no. the girl? No, no, no. There was somebody else that was, that was there. They initially told the police, oh, I saw him hit a girl. Okay. And then he changed his story before trial. Oh, and they said he didn't, that, that he didn't see him hit a girl. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. And then, like, there was another person that said that they were, you know, they were, they were drinking beer, and then, like, they were just like, we couldn't really remember the, the timeline of events, you know, so it got, it got, fu- you know, fuzzy. And they're, you know, but despite the fact that their testimonies don't seem to be consistent, the conviction went the other way, so. Unsettling. I, I don't know how to talk about this very well. I don't mm. know what to say. I'm like a video game guy. I'm like an entertainer. <laughs> this is, this is ho- I mean, it's horrific, but I don't have all the details either. Well, let's talk mm. about the uh, the other story then. We've got this story from People. Video show Chicago police firing mm-hmm. 96 shots in less than one minute during deadly traffic stop. Dexter Reed was killed during that stop. Now, how come... You know what? I'm, I, I did this on my earlier segment, but I'll just do this right now. Let's, uh, let's just... I'll just fix the headline while we're here. Let's see, article headline, and uh, here's a text, and we'll, uh, some editorial guidelines here for people. Let's put, uh, man shoots at cops, is killed after they return fire. And there we go, people, uh, there we go. The headline has now been fixed. I did that in real time. Was not hard, People Magazine. Maybe you could, uh, you know, that could be, that could be your, your, your title for this article, but unfortunately it's not. All, the, almost every major news outlet is writing the headline like this. The pictures they're showing of him. I'll see if People Magazine has it. They show him like in in his graduation. And I'm like, look, we get it. People have good photos. They have bad photos. But this is a, this is a video where they're like, why was he even stopped? Uh, they say he didn't have a seatbelt on. He gets pulled over. He, pull, he, he appears to have something covering his face. The cop says, don't roll your window up. He's just rolling his window up. And she's like, stop, stop. She backs up, pulls out her weapon. There's several officers surrounding the vehicle screaming, stop, roll the window down. And then all of a sudden you hear bang, bang, bang. And they all run screaming, shots fired, shots fired. One of the cops got shot. So then they open fire on the vehicle and then he comes out, dies. They find a vehicle, uh, they find a gun in the passenger seat. So the question is like, why did he roll up his window and not get out of the car? He had a gun. But he shot through his window or did he, the window was still cracked and he fired out the window at someone through the window. It does look like in the video, like glass may go flying or something. So he may have opened fire. The the media has been very careful in how they reported this. The police have said he shot a cop. Cop got shot. Yeah. When he he turned, when I search his name on brave search, Dexter Reed, says a 26 year old black man was shot and killed by Chicago police officers during a traffic stop on March 21st, 2024. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They always make it look like as the police uh, going around attacking uh, Afro-Americans, right? It's it's just like uh, they build up even in the media with these headlines, this hatred toward the police up to the movement defund the police. To me, the police should be paid so much more. When I see the crime scene in America, I would make a movement to increase the salaries of the police and stop uh, harassing them uh, in the media and let them do their job. I mean, it's to me, it just hey. sounds crazy. Look at look at W G N nine Chicago, Copa. This is cop oversight. Police fired 96 times after being fired upon in fatal Humboldt Park shooting last month. That's, hey, that's, that's, that's an acceptable headline. How about that mm-hmm. one? I accept it. After they were fired upon. But look, look what happens when you Google this. Look at all the, all the, all the stories. 
Head of Chicago Police Oversight wants officers stripped of powers. Mm. Dexter Reed body camera footage shows 96 uh, fi- shots fired. Deadly Chicago traffic stop where police fired 96 shots. Raises questions about use of force. Mm. Dexter Reed shot and killed by police after traffic stop. None of these, even the New York Post, none of them say. And look, look at look at Washington Post does. Like, come on, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sad that somebody oh died here. Okay, I, I don't yeah, want that to be the case. Obviously. But when they complain that. Whenever a person is committed, you know, convicted of a crime or, or arrested for a crime, they use these horrible photos. Well, dude, this guy is accused of shooting at cops 11 times, striking one of them, and then they returned fire. And this is the photo you choose to use? Yeah, even Jeffrey Dahmer has a beautiful college picture at his graduation, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, they can post that one of them from now on. Yeah. So a lot of people are saying this is them trying to manufacture another George Floyd mm. just in time for the election. Was it, did, did you see the video of his mother? No. They killed no. my son. <laughs> he was just riding in this car and they killed him and then she faints. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so she's, you know, helping bolster that narrative quite nicely. She said he was just riding his car and they killed him. He said, I'm going him. for a ride. That's all he was doing. Why did they kill him? It's like, and then she, she faints. Shot at them. She's like, oh, because she's lying in public. <laughs> Is that she's like, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> I did wrong. I, I think it's, it's fair to say that there's a possibility he didn't fire on them. The cops. A scared cop fired first, and that's why maybe news news outlets, some news outlets are trying to be careful. But when even the oversight agency said, no, they were fired on first, it's like, okay, well, then that's the premise we operate under. They found a gun in his car. Occam's razor suggests the cops did not accidentally shoot him, pull an acorn scenario where they think they're being shot at, kill a guy, and then have a gun to plant. That's movie made up stupid BS. Hey, I don't trust <laughs> Chicago cops. I got stories. But Occam's razor here, guys. The simple solution is a dude who did not want to get out, his, get out of his car, I wonder why, who was covering his face and rolling his window up, had a reason not to, apparently, mm-hmm. and it was a gun, and then he used it on them. There you go. So it's still unknown if he opened fire first. No, There's... even police oversight said he did. He did? Yeah, the body camera footage shows the cops running the vehicle. You hear gunshots go off, and the cops run, screaming, shots fired, shots fired. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm being very specific about what the, what the video shows. Oversight then said he fired on them first. So I don't know, I don't know what else you do. Like... Occam's razor, the, the least amount of assumptions. Yeah, that's him shooting. A cop got shot. I don't think another cop just like shot a cop in the leg. Yeah. Well, this is the modern state of uh, politics in this country, I suppose. Yeah, no, they they want embolden criminals and uh, demonize police and the law and order. That's all they're trying to fight: law and order. Mm-hmm. And Somebody just, and just like with Trump, there's no pivot. You know, I mean, like they're just they're doing the same stuff with Trump this election cycle that they did in the first election cycle, just trying to make the same thing work again. And perhaps this is another instance of that. Like they're just like, okay, well, let's do George Floyd 2.0. Can we make that work? Yeah, because Which they want to. I, I don't think they want riots. A lot of people are saying they want to make riots happen before an election. No, they want to bolster Black Lives Matter and that narrative mm. and blame Trump. Yeah, they, w- they were waiting for Trump to get elected to, to <laughs> incite another riot. Mm, mm. <laughs> right. yep. Yeah, after Trump's president, then they can claim he's a dictator and try and remove him or something. Yeah. Mega Mikey says a year ago, Dexter Reed was charged on three counts of unlawful use of a firearm. Also, they never used his mugshot for the cover uh, photo. That's why police pulled him over. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, I also read that he had tinted windows or something. Tinted, tinted windows are a quick way to get pulled out of your car in Chicago because uh, I believe beyond 35%, uh, less than 35, 35% tint, then they're illegal. Mm. So that means like, that's a, that's a decent amount of light blocking, 35%. It means only 35% of light can actually get through the tint. So this is fairly dark. And then what ends up happening is a cop can't see what's going on. You roll your window up and now they're like, okay, that's a threat. Mm-hmm. You won't get out of your vehicle and this is what you get. Man, I'm not yeah. sure what, I'm not, what are you thinking? My creativity about that. I'm just so drained from the Civil War movie and these like bouts of street <laughs> violence. Like it doesn't bring me any joy. It stresses me out. It's I horrible. love to make great things and it's like hard to watch this sometimes. Like, it's important to acknowledge, but God, you know, healing. I want to heal the brain too. What were you going to say something about it? It sounds like you're just overwhelmed by the, the both the fictional representations of crime and the real life crime. We're analyzing <laughs> think, right maybe now. that's and what I going can totally on. I can totally relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. I was listening tough. to a lot of explosions earlier today in that movie theater for like two uh-huh. hours. It was pretty Is that intense. a prediction? Did you feel like a sort of prediction, something that is likely to come uh, to reality soon? Not like that. No, I think. I think fascist, a peaceful fascist takeover is more likely yes. where people start putting themselves in pods and just plugging in and like plugging their, their veins into like a nutrition dump. And they're like, uh, we're there. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're, this we're, this we're, is literally what's happening right now. Yeah. A, uh, you get a letter in the mail saying jury duty and people crumple it up and throw it in the garbage. And they're like, I ain't doing that. 
And then you end up with someone facing very serious charges and the government is like, we want to put him in jail forever. And if you want to go home, you have to say yes. And then the jurors are like, Ugh, I, I don't care about this guy. I just want to go home. Fine. Whatever you want to do. Bye. That's where we're at. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is. Uh, uh, you get a dictatorship when regular people are not interested in, in, in jury duty. You're right. The era yeah. of 12 angry men isn't really what we're living in now. I mean, there's not really going to be that one lone voice. I mean, I guess there are people like that that actually would stand up for some sort of principles or they'd really dig into a case and say, no, I don't. I think everybody, I think all the people in this room are wrong. But I think the, the capacity for people to express that is pretty low, generally and, speaking. And right those now. jurors are losing work days. The longer they stay there, they're, right. I, I don't know if they're not getting paid. I don't know how jury dirty work. Jury dirty. <laughs> jury <laughs> dirty. They get a, it, like a modified it, payment. It, they get a modified. We're, we're never going to the system's never going to be fixed. Congress is yeah. never going to pass a bill. There's no incentive for corrupt people to fix the system. We yeah. It needs to be that if you get jury duty, then you you show how much money you make at your job and they cover it 100%. And then they would just get yeah. poor people. That would be yep. probably the case. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're right. That's true. And I was called for a jury duty during my immigration process. And I was not even eligible for being uh, wow, what, in really? the jury. And they, they were threatening me. If you don't uh, present yourself this day at the court in Los Angeles, uh, we're going to start a criminal proceeding for breaching your duty. And then I called. I said, listen, I have an exemption because I actually I can't. <laughs> I can't be there in my current status. So they let me go. But it was pretty uh -huh. odd. You know, I got a jury duty call before my green card. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess that's, it's how they vote wild. too with the ballots. I don't know how many legal votes here, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. I've never mm -hmm. been illegal. But you know how they things operate. And it looks like they don't do their due diligence well enough. The, I, another thing is it's important to remember is innocent people are innocent until they're proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of any kind. They're innocent, and that's the way the legal system works. And it's got to continue to stay like that. I think culturally, people think very differently in terms of that. Now, it's not really just like guilty, uh, innocent until proven guilty. I think that the guilt just sort of gets showered on people, especially if they're a demonized person or a public mm -hmm. demonized person. And uh, that makes it even more complicated for, you know, fair application of the law. Like I've seen it's funny the founding fathers are like, innocent until proven guilty. And the, and, the, and, the, and the people are just like, we don't care. But that's that's really kind of the basic, you know, raw human emotion is just to declare somebody guilty instead of going in the opposite direction, which is what the founding fathers envisioned. Like that's a very that's a very base human impulse to just, you know, come with people at like a you know like a Frankenstein with the fire torches. You just want to take them down. It really you know, is kill the bad guy. A country of restraint. The United States is a country. The, the Constitution is immense restraint. Those guys understood. You have to hold back your willingness and want to use power. That is what this is all about. Let your neighbors be great. Mm -hmm. Media makes uh, sentences more than courts today, right? Yep. So they brainwash people so much. Think about uh, Trump. Everybody has been accused of so many things, but in the perception, uh, he's guilty of that many things. And those because of the media. Right. Yeah, I mean, you look at the, fra uh, the, the fraud cases and all this stuff. There's they, they just the judge just bangs the gavel and says, it's true. And then you get these people screaming on camera being like, it's true, it's true, this proves it. And it's mm -hmm. like, man... Yeah. It's how you, this is how you get Nazis. It's how you get Stalin. It's how you get communists. Totally. Regular people are like, what is that authority? It's true. Okay. <laughs> it's true then. It's easier than thinking. Yep. It yeah. is. Trust, totally. tr trust the science. Jimmy mm -hmm. Dore's great bit where he's like, you know, on no other subject would someone say this. Like, you're going to buy a car. It's like, well, don't look into it. It's like, what? How am I supposed to know which car to buy? Ask the salesman. He's the expert. <laughs> That's how these people live. The authority is everything. Nothing else matters. It's wild. I wonder if it's just like a natural filtration process where credentialism, mm. critical thinkers who are like, I don't know if this guy is telling me the truth regardless of his credentials are filtered out. And the left is literally just people who believe whatever they hear mm. from, yeah. from a trusted authority. I don't even know if it's necessarily the leftists. I mean, like I, I think about some of the people that I know and some of the people even, even in my family and like, they're not really leftists. Like they don't have any kind of like core political ideology that guides them. It's just, they just turn on the corporate press and it's get poisoned by it. The it's authority. Whatever the authority it. says is fine. Yeah. And the yeah. level of comfort yeah, yeah. in the mm -hmm. country for people like, if I just go along with what I'm told, I'll get to do this again tomorrow. Right. Get to sit in my house and retire. And yeah, get your dopamine drip from your phone. You know, the, you have nothing that really o o overly like pokes you or prods you into changing anything because you're like, oh, well, this is nice. I sit with my phone. It's like, oh, well, that's happening outside there. You said in the movie too, like it, that war's happening over there. It's not happening in my neighborhood. It takes a lot yeah. to get to, to an actual person yep. actually bother them to do anything, you know? Even people that are like at morally ethical, ethical can be 
just twisted by that that behavior of like oh, just so accepting easily. what you're being told from the outside. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of them are just trapped in it, hopelessly so, which is really think, sad. But yeah, killing critical thinking is the best way to control. Totally. You know, so yeah. I think it's a technique mastered by every dictatorship on a side or another. Uh, look at Italy and the bad history of fascism some times ago. That was exactly the trust in the authority as you trust God. So you never question, you know, right? So that's really like going to uh, to attack the critical thinking, which you should, you know, talk and preserve and uh, l teach people how to think. You're talking about Mussolini? Oh, yeah. Is that what he did? Yes. What like it? basically uh, equalizing authority to God, you know, like uh, you trust your, whatever the authority tells you, it's, a, it's like a God word. So people accept everything you say, even if it's evil, like just, uh, you know, like I think the liberals are doing that in America. <laughs> everything that comes from their mouth is sacred in many ways, right? Nobody question it. Nobody what, question Joe Biden, come on. Was it like that with, Mus do you know a lot about the history of Mussolini? Was it like that before he came to power with people just blind authority and... and no, he's the one who actually uh, came to power with, uh, you know, with very good principles, but completely twisting them and pushing them to the extent of uh, using a, a good facade of uh, values uh, to convince people to believe in him and the authority as God. Let's say uh, it's like liberals talk about uh, inclusion and non-discrimination, but actually they are doing exactly the opposite. They are discriminating everyone who thinks differently. They are everything but liberal when it comes to inclusions, because if you are a MAGA or a right-wing person, they, you're seen as hell and actually everything that happens to you, even if somebody kills me today, it's okay because, you know, she was a right-wing propagandist, you know, I've seen that threats on my social media where they feel entitled to hate you based on your political beliefs and Mussolini was the same. Basically, good values, low family and country, but not just as a facade to uh, give up trust to people in the authority, like blind trust, and then make them accept uh, alliances with Nazi without questioning it. Did he turn on his own people? Uh, well, Italian Jews, yes. <laughs> oh, he did. Was that after he allied with the Nazis? Yes, yes. He just went along with Hitler? Yes. Like a lot of people, I, I've actually considered that he's kind of, he was Hitler's mentor in the early days. Like Hitler looked at him and was like, ooh, that's what a good dictator is like. And, and Mussolini had invaded, I think, Northeast Africa. Yes, yes. And then Hitler was like, I'm just going to invade because everybody's oh. doing it now. I Italy was very safe. It was uh, providing a certain level of uh, general wealth, you know, like people were living well. So people, and they generated into them this trust and this uh, like religious trust in the authority. And this is dangerous. Because they were doing well, it, it was able to generate a blind trust. Yes. In the authority, because they they felt like they were getting their yes their livelihood from the authority. Yes, and if you hear like old people, even right now, they would say, "Oh, the good time." Like I'm talking about 95 years old people in Italy, the good time of Mussolini, because uh, they are completely cut off. You know, the rest. We just remember the quality of life of this time. But uh, I, I see that technique in the liberals today in America, they master it so well. Like uh, they, they actually are masters in projection and they use nice words to incite people to do bad things, right? So everything that happened to a Trump supporter is uh, good. It's, uh, even if it, the most vile action, harassment is fine because you're a bad guy, you are the bad guy, right? But then they are the one that promotes inclusion, tolerance. Actually, they scream like psychopaths if you don't agree with them. I mean, there's a level of intolerance that is unprecedented in any culture I've seen in the world. I mean, these people are unhinged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, toxically compassionate sometimes, with especially with letting people across the border illegally in mass in these mobs. That's like, yes, inclusion, inclusion. But like, if you include poison in your veins, you're going to die. So like, you can't include everything around you. If you include uh, a mass murderer in your at your dinner table, you're going to be in a, probably a lot of trouble if he decides to go haywire. So like, you really got to be careful about who you. I'm not saying to be uh, xenophobic because people are phenomenal, but in the wrong, you know, you got to be discerning in the way you include people yeah that's yeah, that's I mean, key uh, they, these people don't have discernment they don't have intellectual or spiritual discernment when it comes to these matters that's that's really interesting about you have to you can't just include poison you know in an injection but that's that's the thing they don't have that that capability or willingness to be discerning of what's good and what's bad 
Maybe because they don't have some core values to rely on, you know, when things are really tough and things are tough right now. Because they were raised on South Park. No offense, guys, <laughs> Trey, but it's that that's a sh- like a hard, nasty show, guys, does a cartoon. Like, little kids that thought that was normal. I, I watched, like, Looney Tunes. And then <laughs> I, South Park was like an adult show, but I think little kids were watching it thinking it was okay to act like they that were. and talk mm-hmm. like that. Because I, I knew kids in, like, grade school, high school who watched South Park. Yeah, and so little oh, yeah. kids were like, "I'm, uh, I'm gonna, uh, this is normal. This is who." And everyone, is- everyone keeps saying like it's a parental issue, and I'm like, "Well, parents have failed them," because we, we like when I was a kid, we couldn't watch Beavis and Butthead. There were parental controls in the cable box, and you needed a four digit code to unlock certain channels. And then only certain episodes, my mom would be like, "Okay, we can watch this one. This one's yep, like, yep." And then uh, today, I just love how it's like as soon as it came to the internet, our society was just like. We no longer need to provide any legal restrictions for for minors on the for for anything. Uh, period. So it's like there's there's a story going around where high school kids are are AI generating porn of their classmates. So these are children. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're just like, what do we do about it? And it's like, uh, like what do you do about kids going to adult bookstores? It's like you don't let them in. <laughs> but for some reason, the internet is full of these people who are like, no, you can't take away my porn. It's like, yeah, we're going to age verify things the way they, 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 they should have been a long time ago mm. and ban young people from uh, unsupervised use of the Internet. I, I just I'm sick of this. It's the parents job. It's like, OK, well, the left is indoctrinating your kids. Then have a nice day. You refuse like the right refuses to use any kind of authority. Like we're at the point where the left is having children strip on stage in like gay clubs and the left and, and the right is still like mm, the parents should be better parents. It's like, well, OK, I guess. Is the right so scared of using authority because they keep being accused of being authoritarians? I don't know, man. I think probably Trump, Trump was when he didn't call out the National Guard on the day two of the George Floyd riot. I'm pretty sure that's why he didn't call him out right away. He didn't want to mm. seem like a fascist total. But um, other people, I think, are maybe the really well thought people that don't want to use the government to authoritarianism to stop this stuff is because they don't want it to get then turned against other aspects of society that aren't unrighteous, that aren't evil that are actually good that some crazy government is like no no you can't say fuck on the internet no you can't say that and that kind of thing and then like Mm. banning people that say that words they don't like and crap like that or imagery they don't like you can't wear red shirts on tuesday no you're banned like you don't want to give any government that kind of authority but then the other option is anarcho tyranny do you want a wide open internet of people showing four-year-olds pornography no no people don't want that either but the right is unwilling to legislate this stuff they're, they're like this. This has been consistently the theme with the right. They will not wield power. They just they 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 win seats in Congress and then go. Okay, now we'll do nothing. You know, I'm thinking, and they all high five as the Democrats encroach mm-hmm. further, and further. I'm thinking of the metaphor of like in a military conflict where one side just refuses to finish the job because it feels like it's just going too far, and then they just get wiped out because they wouldn't finish the job. Well, we have to get rid uh, from the dictatorship of the politically correct on the right as well. Like we are afraid to take any action or implement any law because we're afraid to be seen as authoritarian or because it's politically sensitive. No, just implement the policies and the platform you voted for and go for it. I want to see more of that in politics on the right side because I agree with Tim. I mean, that things shouldn't be allowed. What would be like a good example of that? How, how would you define that? Well, just just put a law that uh, ban uh, basically access uh, uh, to certain content uh, to you know, minors and uh, just like code something. I know internet is very difficult to regulate, but we have to do it at some point. It should be a major issue from legislators to make sure that kids and minors don't have access to this content or punish whoever violate these norms or not giving access uh, to, uh, I don't know, uh, clubs uh, like that to minors that are uh, dancing on stage, uh, you know, like gay club stages and doing all these kind of things. Uh, we are afraid to come across as authoritarian. Well, that's get rid uh, from the fear of this dictatorship that is the politically correct. There is nothing such as politically correct. There is your platform, you have been voted for upon and just make your job to make sure the society is in order because you know the responsibility is not only the family i'm sorry it's not this is this is what that civil war movie needed it needed like a scene where the journalists come across uh, a, a drag show for kids outside of like some town and then like uh, like the, the movie starts with a bunch of people begging for water from an aid truck and then a person with an american flag runs in and ieds and it should have been a, a drag show for kids, 
that someone mm. runs in. The 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 Civil War narrative film needs to actually address modern politics to make its point. Otherwise, it's just, hey, look, war. And I guess the idea is like in war films, people don't internalize it. They say, wow, that's happening over there. And they don't realize that if it were to happen here, what it would look like. So I can respect that film in that respect. But there needs to be a film where it just like outright shows what the left does and then how the right responds and then take it to like, take it up a notch. The funny thing is like, we're talking about this film and you know, this is fear of civil war, but the element that's missing from the narrative is the weird behaviors of the factions, mostly the left and like what they're trying to defend. Like the founding fathers are like life, liberty, and, and, and family. And the left is like, we want kids to read naughty books. Like that's their, their, their motive. I, yeah. The desire for full access to everything for kids is like mm. a little over the top. I I'm sorry, man, but I, I, I was sorry. I'm sorry to, <laughs> that, to admit that I used to be like that, that I was very much like all of it all the time. Mm. Open it all up. We've just now unlocked the internet. This is the new paradigm. Brace yourself, plug everybody in. Like that was very, I was just like the writing's on the wall. Why deny it? Here we go. And I feel like I've actually kind of pushed us towards that in a way. I used to make videos about it on YouTube and they would get, they were pretty well received by people. They'd be confused, but they'd be like, really? Oh, and, uh, but the reality is you got to protect those kids' brands. Yeah. The principle is right until you can see now what they did of it, you know, <laughs> it mm -hmm. was not the principle itself I can relate to, but when you see the, the generation of the content, it's just crazy. You need to do something. I mean, I'm such a boomer in terms of technology. I, I find it hard to believe that you actually could implement legislation that keeps minors and children from accessing you know pornography and stuff like that could that you even matter. do it like kids are gonna get fake ids and sneak into adult bookstores exact oh, okay all right we still so, we still say they can't do it but ultimately if it was implemented it would prevent a lot of kids from doing right. it so we make it so that these i and a lot of states are doing it you want to right yeah. you want to log into a website you got to send in your id yeah. And then people are like, people are like, Tim say what Kamala Harris said. And it's like, I don't care. I literally don't care. Cry yeah. about it. Cry all day. Like my position is my position. I don't care it if you're Nikki, angry. It was Nikki Haley. <laughs> Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley sorry. said that. Mm. Yeah, Nikki Haley is like, we should have IDs for the internet. But what did she say? Like everyone should be yep. verified or something? In order to use the internet, <laughs> yeah. you should have to verify oh. your at, your identity. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the clarified version of what, I don't know what she's talking about. I'm saying <laughs> if you want to go to the grocery store, you don't need anything. You can walk right in, walk right out. That's fine. No one needs to card you to leave your home. If you want to go to an adult bookstore or casino, you got to show an ID. Technically, if you're a minor and you're alone, can't you just get picked up by the cops and taken home? Yes. Like you're not allowed yes. to be walking around outside as a well, minor. Well, it depends on the time of day. Like in Chicago, they have curfew. And it's wild. I've never been picked up for curfew. I'm pretty sure my brother has though. The only ever time I got stopped for curfew, I was with my brother. And so they just said, hey, you shouldn't be out. And he's like, he's with me. I'm I'm old enough. And they're like, whatever. And then they just drove, drove off. Mm. But they will actually, you'll like, I think that's insane. You're 16. You're walking down the street in Chicago at 1030 and the cop will pull over, but get in where yeah. you live. And like, that's the most conservative, like, here's the funny, so such a conservative law to look, put up against like four-year-olds seeing porn on their iPhone. Here's the funny stories. Like I've heard a bunch of funny stories about like my friends would get picked up for curfew and then the cops would be like, your parents have to sign for you. And they would go, okay. And then they would give them the address on the other side of the alley from their home. Cause I, I don't know if like how many cities are like this, uh, but in Chicago, it's like every house has a, a backyard and a garage. And then you go through the alley and there's another garage. And so they're like back to back. And so he's like, this is my house. I'll, I'll go get my parents. And then he walks out, walks into the backyard of a stranger's house turns right, turns left, jumps the fence, jumps the fence again into his house, goes in his house and just closes the door. Wow. And then the cops just are like, it's no gone. idea. <laughs> He's just gone. <laughs> and they wait there for a certain amount of time and they're like, whatever, and they leave. But it is pretty, it's always been pretty wild to me that I'm like, you could be 16 years old and if you're out at 11 o'clock, like that's crazy because when I was like 16, I'd go to the comic shop. We'd play like arcade, we'd play Marvel vs. Capcom. And then at like 1030, I'd rollerblade home or something. Well, no, when I was 16, I was skateboarding. When I was 13, I was rollerblading. But then I'd be like skateboarding home and I'm like, what, a cop would just pick me up? Never happened. I, I, they don't really mess with people on wheels. I never got messed with. I was always on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good tip then. Go on wheels. No, I knew, I knew a kid who got a speeding ticket on a skateboard. Oh my gosh. How fast yeah. was he going? Like 20 something. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he was bombing a hill. Wow. And so the cops like went after him and he was like, I think it was a longboard or something, <laughs> but he was bombing this big hill and the speed limit was like 20. It might've, it might've been a speed limit 15, I think. 
And then he was going like, but I think he was going like 20 miles an hour. Wow. And then the cops, and then he like oh. slid in the grass and then they wrote him a ticket. And he's like, what? They're like, you were speeding. And he's like, what? And he's like, law didn't say anything about what kind of vehicle you have to be on. Oh, mm -hmm. that's yeah. good to know. Well, I just got my one, license today, by the way, talking about speeding. I passed the driving test on the first try. I had my, I got my first drive test 30 years ago, but I'd let it lapse and expire. So I hadn't taken it since. I was kind of excited to take the test again and find cool. out. Nice. I still got it, baby. Yeah, they, that's they, a milestone, when, that's man. Congratulations. When, Ian would say that when, uh, when he was taking the test, they start you up. You have, you have to score uh, at least a, a 95 to pass, and they start you off minus 10 points if you're a white male. Mm -hmm. What? I'm so kidding. I had to go behind <laughs> I was the like, counter, no, you know, get I was down like, on my I knees, like, it's possible. pray. It's possible. Pray. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, maybe it's possible. You it know, is, this goes crazy. Everything's possible. <laughs> yeah. well, that's another weird thing I used to Ian, say. Ian had to get his license because uh, we're moving. This room is empty and you can't even tell. Yeah, I'm going to be commuting to work after oh, the Oh, wow. I didn't even notice. Lit. The room's You're empty. You're right. Oh, yeah, no one, no, one, no one watching the show can realize that we're in an empty room right now move is real it's happening mm -hmm. but it is funny because no one can even see the table that we're sitting at yeah it's a big People, nice table by the way someone <laughs> someone once told me that they thought the show was all of us at our own little desks in separate parts of the room and i was like that's weird when, we, <laughs> when i first <laughs> what it started i was like a, alone in a corner desk remember no, no, we no, had no, malice that was, and that jones on the first one like that, early that, on first you were actually just sitting off to the side and oh yeah that was at the old jersey house we had an extra set in the corner where you could come and go if we had extra guests. Yeah. I'd so like, I'd, you could hear me on the mic, but he'd be way over there. So it'd be real weird talking to him when he was like But that was when we had away. extra people. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. came up and you'd sit down and we were like, like, yeah, we need a bigger desk. We should talk to Thomas Massey build. about um, said, doing legislation to ban this stuff because he's the most righteous congressman as far as I can tell, in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Agreed. I'd like to get his I don't know. I kind of feel that. like he'd just be like, I'm opposed to any kind of restrictions and regulations. You, you think he's going to lean I, super libertarian parents on that? should do it. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like, I guess it's true that parents should do it. I don't know, man. But I think what's going to happen then is that the far left lies to parents. The parents then go, go along with it and the kids' brains fall out of their heads. Schools That's exactly could, what's happening. Schools yeah. could ban phones. You could make public schools ban phones. Did we lose a lot of fight footage but, that's floating around out there? Yeah. <laughs> but isn't it the right left that uh, is claiming authority to take over parenthood uh, if they consider that the parents are not uh, understanding uh, of the gender journey? Oh, no, it's not mm -hmm. even that. The, the left has already said it's our children. Exactly. Yep. Like, yeah. so, or something they said it's our children. So, you know, you have on the side, uh, they claim authority, they take over. And on the other side, they'll let it to the parents, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to find a middle ground because uh, they're taking over in any way. Anyway. Yep. That's true. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. Um, I don't, I mean, it's it's not like you bring a gun to school. Like bringing a phone to school is not like bringing a gun to school, but the Worse. information can warp your mind in such a way that it can never be undone. Like I still remember that movie, Chances Are, I was talking about last night, just some weird mm -hmm. movie I saw where the guy dates his, is reborn, oh, like, yeah. he dates it. his daughter. Yeah. Oh Cra my it's God. Robert Downey Jr., mm -hmm. Sybil Shepherd, and uh, it twisted my mind, not necessarily in a horrible way. <laughs> right. What was it called? Chances, Chances are. are. And this is where like the guy dies and comes back and then tries to bang his daughter. Yeah. He's so in love that he runs through the line waiting to get vaccinated. So he, he forgets his past life and then he, he just bypasses that and gets reborn and then he starts to he meets a girl he's dating her and then he starts to remember that it's his daughter i guess it's been so long since i saw it what's the but name of the chances are chances but it was are. like a sexual fantasy of mine as a kid it was weird twisted me in a weird way bang your daughter yes. it wasn't i don't even remember that aspect i just remember sybil shepherd being real hot and i was like she's really attractive and robert down jr is really making her really attractive in this movie somehow and I was like 10 or 12, and it was it stuck with me for years after that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see that movie no that, knew that young. That, that probably would be a trip. Yeah, yeah it was weird, <laughs> a mind warp. Uh -huh. for, that was just a simple movie. So these, these phones in schools, if a kid's like, look, and they show you the most graphic, you don't even ask for it, and a kid's like, look at this. Because kids are, can be pretty dickish in school. Like, I've had kids come up and do some pretty cruel shit to me. And like, if a kid just shows someone some horrid shit, like, do you blame their parent? Do you have to guilt by association? Or do you, what do you do? Take, what were you going to say? Well, I mean, like right now it's, they're, they literally just like, this is you naked. You know, I mean, that's what they're doing. They got these AI generated photos. I mean, they could literally just like show you what seems to be you without clothes on. I mean, that's how crazy AI is and how quickly it's erupted. I mean, and in terms of who do you appeal to first, I mean, my first thought would be the parents, but I guess everybody would deal with it differently. Do you think it's like too tyrannical to, to, petition public schools to ban like the department of education to ban phones cell phones from public schools maybe 
Maybe not. Maybe it's a good idea. Good. I mean, it's very difficult to control, you know, because, uh, for example, uh, I have a you know young niece and uh, she's at school. This is in Italy. We have the same issues. And uh, her parents told her not to bring. A, they never allowed her to have a phone. But when she goes to school, all her friends at school have a phone. So just play with their phone, you mm-hmm. know. So <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's maybe this is a solution. Homeschool your kids. Uh, she is eight. Homeschool. Yeah, mm-hmm. homeschool. Yeah. Homeschool your kids. Yeah. Kids don't listen to you at home. Homeschool. Yeah. Really? I think homeschool I mean, is the same. My kids are really young, <laughs> you know, and they listen and they listen as good as they can. They're, you know, three and a half and two. But I, I've also talked to parents that have done the homeschooling thing and they all, they often report that my kids don't listen to me. And they don't and listen I mean, in school either. Right. But but the but I've also heard uh, stories from people that's just like, well, I couldn't teach my kid how to play guitar, even though I'm a guitar player. You know, my kid will not listen to me. So he had to send his kid to, you know, a professional, you know, teacher. I mean, I know it sounds counterintuitive. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but this is these this is the anecdotal stories that I'm hearing as I'm really trying to sort out what I'm going to do with these kids when it comes time to go into school. And I'm totally conflicted about it. You know, I've got I got t- some time to figure it out, but I really don't know what the right move is. I think it's what, what, you, I think the right move is what humans did for 40,000 years, 50,000 years. But we're not in that time anymore. Yeah, now you got to We're that. we're into the vortex. We, you like, I, I I can see why that that phenomenon you're talking about happens like the external authority is like okay it's not my parents have been telling me what to do for three five years i'm i'm whatever you're telling me one more yes. thing to do this guy now is telling me something new and he's fresh so i've got some added added um, intensity to this being told so maybe if you have a tutor come over to your house and teach them with you and let the kids know you're as good as they are and you're an equal authority then they'll look to you with that mm. value well perhaps homeschool your kids it's That's probably the, the only solution or like yep. set, do it in the backyard or get out of the house too. You think changing the venue might help? I don't know. I'm just throwing stuff out there. Maybe not. It's it's really tough to say. The other thing is that like, what I've heard is that like kids that have really bad home lives will behave at home because they're terrified of what their parents will do. But then they go to, uh, you know, daycare or like a preschool and they're, they're wild. They act crazy and they have problems at school. Mm. But kids that have a good home life, they act crazy at home. But they behave themselves outside of the home because they are they, they kind of have they they get all that stuff out with their parents. But when they're with somebody that's not their parents, they already know how to behave. I mean, this is, I, I, I talk to a lot of people that are parents. So I'm really trying to sort this out for myself, and I think it's really really complicated. It's more complicated than just homeschool your kids is what I'm getting at. Yeah, but I mean, like even back in the day, some dude would get a homestead in the middle of nowhere with his family. He'd have like four or five kids and a wife, and they the kids would farm and the kids would work. But Great. It's only, it's only, it's only we're not now. back in the day, though. We're right. Not back so, in the day. So, 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 then what's the issue? I, I will get back that, to you on that. that. I don't know because I'm, we're I'm in still the in the middle of it. century. Children have just stopped acting like children have for hundreds of thousands of years. I don't I think hundreds that's nece- or thousands of years. I don't think that's necessarily a crazy thing to posit because I mean, like, look, I mean, we we're we're just talking about how like you have AI generated nudes that people are showing each other of themselves in high schools. But that's why like, you don't you homeschool your kids. I know, but you don't give your kid phones. You don't give your kid phones. Yeah, don't give your kid. So a phone. when do you give your kid a phone? Sixteen, maybe. Okay, so you're a sixteen year old in school. Well, you you have your phone, phone, like. Huh? No, you're not in school. You're homeschooled. But it, but it, I mean, like the the problem of the phone Pod technology learning, still exists. Neighbors. Yeah, friends. If you, if we have a friend that has a phone, or they have yeah. their mom's phone or something. So you don't. And then you just don't let them hang out at that person's house because they have a phone at the house. That's intense. That, I mean, my mom wouldn't. I I knew a kid in the neighborhood that put gasoline on the ground and lit it on fire and they were like ha ha yeah and I went home and I told my parents I was like it was cool we were like and my dad was like you can never hang out with him again he's a fireman you, and I never like, hung out with him again you never can, saw him you again you can accept that moral degeneracy is here to stay that children are gonna get access to phones and scat porn and snuff and, and murder and all of these things and there's nothing you can do about it so give up give up this is what this is the, this is the position that conservatives take, have taken on abortion conservatives have said we cannot win the abortion argument so abandon it and, and Trump mm. came out and said well let the states decide they're literally saying it's baby murder, but the states can decide if they want to murder babies. That's they, They've abandoned the moral position. This is why many pro-lifers are mad at Trump right now, mm-hmm. because he's not arguing. So if the argument is, look, we're in this era, you can't stop kids, they're going to do it, then accept your kids will grow up to be degenerates. It's going to happen, have fun. You can't do anything about it. Or you can homeschool your kids and, and reject it and do your best to, to keep your family away from this stuff. And then perhaps they'll places. be regenerates. 
Regenerates. Regenerates. <laughs> Redemption Operate pattern. Regenerates. <laughs> Agent <Not like> regeneration. <laughs> Redemption <laughs> pattern from the generation. <laughs> I'm raising a bunch of regenerations. I think, I think the reason why, you know, we had um, uh, Nick Freitas on the show. Great guy. Talking about his family. And I was like, I feel like, you know, I asked him about his, his family. And if it, I, I mentioned the, the phase of, you know, I hate you, dad. And he's like, we never had that. And I was like, I, I figured, and I was going to ask you this because of just like his moral demeanor and the way he behaves and stuff. I don't think. I was like, based on who he is, he would have that phase where his kids were like, I hate you. And I said, I think the reason we've developed this I hate you dad phase is because parents leave their kids. How was it for tens of thousands of years? As soon as a kid was old enough, he was grabbing the wood to help the dead. He'd say, do what you can. The kid was, he's like, okay, you're, you're six, you're old enough now, pick up that bucket of water, bring it over to me. And the kid would do it. And so that kid was with the dad and the mom all day working at the house and working on the house was how you did things. Mm -hmm. Now today, dad leaves and the kids are sitting there with no dad. And then dad comes home and the kids have no idea what dad does. And then kids are spending most of their time and their authority figures are strangers. So mm -hmm. now you're getting the, I hate you, dad or mom. They're not going to listen to what you say because you are actually not their real parent. You're a biological parent. But you are not the person who has been there the whole time teaching them how to live. You've been an ancillary character there half the time, while the other half, it's been a group of strangers in a building who treat them like crap. And that's that's what we've been for 100 years. My parents did a pretty cool thing where they unified. They had a, like I was never able to get one of them to do something the other one wouldn't allow. They, they were like behind my back, a solid unit. And so I kind of, my dad would work for two days at a time. He's a fireman for 24 hours. He'd go work at a hospital as an orthopedic technician. Then he'd come back on day three and he'd be with us for a day. And so I didn't see him a lot, I, but because they were so unified, I felt like he was still present. And we would still, my mom would take us to go see him, give him lunch every once in a while, but I felt like he was still present. So when he was there, I still sensed his authority through her. And I could tell like he was the man in the house when and, he was around. And the way it used to be was that kids lived basically the same lives as their grandparents. Granddad woke up and he tended the crops and the chickens and he'd feed the pigs and then he'd come in and then he'd take care of, you know, house stuff. He'd be building something and the kids would watch him. And then when the kid was old enough, he'd be like, hey, hand me that hammer here. Let me show you what I'm doing. Then the kid's a teenager and he's like, you're responsible for the chickens now. You're old enough. And then the kid would become an adult and be like, Dan, I'm going to get married. I'm 18 years old. And he's like, there's a very fine Mary Sue down the street. Wow. Mary Sue and the families would come together and there'd be a dowry. And then they'd all come together and help build a house for the kid. And then the kid would grow up doing literally what his dad did, what his granddad did. And their lives were very similar and they were learning from each other. And then we industrialized. And then we were like, time to put kids in pseudo factories where the bell rings every shift change so they can be good little workers, take them from their parents and put them in the coal mines. And then all of a sudden the kids are not learning from their parents anymore. We totally separated family. And then it's no surprise the level of degeneracy that we have now. It's, it's like you ask yourself how we went thousands of years with zero degeneracy. And then in the span of three generations, we went as far as you could possibly go well, that's because we cut kids off from their parents. And we, we, we haven't seen the last 2000, there might've been a lot of degen in the last 2000 years, there was. degeneracy, but it's oh, all, sure. on, yeah. a lot of it's mm -hmm. on camera now. So it's like <laughs> undeniable. <laughs> right. It's documented. Yeah. And it's all yeah. about leading by example, right? So when you anarchy take over, that's what happens. I mean, like before it was completely different, you know, I come from Italy where it's a pretty conservative, uh, uh, you know, lifestyle and still we have a reality like that, but I can see this shifting uh, and getting closer and closer to what we see here now. Who's so, the Italian prime minister? It's she, a Georgia Meloni. Yeah. Is she cool? She seemed like she was like, she like a national. She's like a, a, yeah, she's actually a big, big uh, right wing uh, patriot. So, you know, she's a, she, she was, she used to emulate Donald Trump up to the election, but now she's uh, kind of disappointing me for her policies uh, toward immigration. Well, she's allowing yes uh, we are experiencing uh, an uh, illegal immigration <clears throat> flaws unprecedented as before Italy uh, is, uh, is she's kind of bending to the European Union socialist uh, dictatorship when it comes to uh, certain policies so she has been uh, uh, voted on a very uh, incredible platform I was one of the people that voted for her uh, but I think uh, some of her promises uh, are not truly met at the moment. But definitely, yes. So she, sh even the most liberal of, of Italians, is a conservative here. So it's a so, kind of difference into uh, looking into politics. We're going to go to super chats. So if you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends, and head over to timcast.com if you'd like to watch the members only uncensored show. The show is only possible thanks 
to viewers like you who become members to support our work and make it all happen. That, uh, that'll be up at 10 p.m. It's going to be fun, not so family friendly. The first comment I'm going to read is from a member. He said, Tim raised a cat, sort of like a kid. Two cats. Okay. <laughs> get it right. And I did right by, by Mr. Bocas. See, we isolated him from the other cats because they had bad behaviors. And so that was the point. He learned from me how to be a cat. He was a good cat. Yeah, I had to scratch things to teach him how to scratch. And uh, he was a good cat. I rubbed Everyone his back one time and he swiped at me. But he, he, his nail came <laughs> I like taught just, him that too. <laughs> just close to my forehead. And I was like, it was a warning. I, got, I respect you, I Bucko. trained him. I said, I said, Bocas. If Ian ever comes at you, you gotta give him the old one two, man. If you just... And then he was like, <laughs> I was like, one two, one two, and then and then he learned. If and only he, he swung it in. If only he didn't pee everywhere. I was like grabbing his back <laughs> and like everywhere. rubbing his back. He was like, yeah. He didn't look angry. He oh, dude, swung. he would just no matter what, he would just pee everywhere. Yeah, I don't get it. Man, so, my parents. So I talk about my parents. That's so wild. But they would always teach me like, don't get male cats. Do not get a male cat. Well, they'll, you they'll gotta, pee all over your you house. Cut your balls off. But no, no. Seamus doesn't do that. He doesn't. Yeah, Seamus is pretty chill. Okay, then it was just Bucko. He's a wild Seamus cat. rolls around on the floor in the house, and then he, he goes and takes a dump in his box. Oh. I love that cat, by the way. Do you way. have cats? Seamus? We did. Our, we're talking about the cat we're talking about just died like a oh, month so ago. Sorry. Yeah. It was really sad. He sorry. was He was wasting away. He had kidney problems. He was born on the street, gutter cat, so he didn't had underdeveloped organs and stuff. And He's man, we got him stem cells. We did a lot for the guy, and it was really great to have him around, but he was like a wild cat inside. It was His kidneys were too small. You might be able to smell his remnants mm -hmm. here, so his urine. His adult body was, the kidneys were doing twice the work for a cat, so he eventually just... But uh, Seamus is chubby. Yeah, Seamus is a great oh. cat. You Shamus, should bring him on the show someday. He's really is he cool. here? He's, he's at the other house. Yeah, oh. Seamus is uh, uh, sassy and chubby. I he's like fat and sassy. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about Seamus 1, not the cartoonist. That's Seamus 2, <laughs> who will be here in, in like two weeks. All right, here we go. Clint Torres says, howdy, people. Howdy. Clint. Shane H. Wilder says, Tim, I would love to hear you do a full review of Civil War, but I'd probably die of alcohol poisoning. <laughs> I guess what I would say the most disappointing thing is I'd like to see a movie about a Civil War, not a movie about journalists on an adventure. But as someone who's done conflict reporting, there was a lot that I really liked about it. Uh, there was one scene in the beginning where when the uh, when the when what I would describe as the MAGA suicider blows up and kills a bunch of innocent people, because that's the movie, I guess. Uh, Kirsten Dunst's character walks over to the corpses and starts taking pictures. And then the young journalist looks at her and takes a picture of her doing it. Yeah. And I was really... like, that was good. Mm. Because too many of these journalists, like, they... It's it's even in the movie they do this, and I'm just like, I know who, I know who they consulted with. These people are such awful... There's like they're all hanging out at the hotel laughing and comparing their photos of corpses and everything. And they're like, wow, that's a really good one pointing to a guy bleeding to death. And uh, they laugh about it and they enjoy doing it. And they're all partying and drinking and uh, they think they're special. So there's like numerous instances where in the movie they act like they're not there as people during a shootout. And there are some scenes where it like, it, you know, bites them in the ass. And so that that's good. Uh, that they show that I think it's important people realize this. The story I like to tell is when I was in uh, Ferguson and the protesters had all left one day and there were like 30 journalists in one big cluttered bunch in front of a, 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 like some kind of APC. And they're all taking pictures, just slowly walking backwards. And the tr truck is slowly moving forward going, you must disperse, go home now. And this, there's no protesters anywhere. It's literally just journalists. Journalists taking pictures, and then the APC goes, journalists, we are talking to you. You must disperse. But these people are, they think they're special. And so they're like, I'm going to get that really cool picture. I've seen journalist stage photos every single time I've been at a protest. In Anaheim, there was one famous incident that went viral where they asked the protesters to, to pause and display the flag for them. A journalist is like, hey, can you come down and hold that flag up for me? Gets a picture. And then they're like, you're asking the, the participants to pose for you? And they're like, what, what do you mean? Yeah, they do it all the time. Mm. It's so fake. I can't stand these people. But anyway, that's why mm. that's one. That's why I enjoyed it. Mm. There's like in the beginning, the young reporter gets smacked in the face by a truncheon, and Kirsten Dunst is like, "Put this vest on." And she's like, "No, I'm not going to." Like, put it on. And I'm like, "Oh, it's it's so obvious." They had the stupidest mainstream journalist uh, with no conflict experience telling these people what to do. Okay, because like. <laughs> An insurance company is going to say, wear a vest. A conflict reporter is going to say, depending on the situation, a vest is a target. So know your surroundings and decide when it's appropriate. And so this idea that like, you're a young journalist in New York, you better wear your, your neon vest. I was like, oh, please, dude. <laughs> there was a, there's a famous story of like a journalist went to, I think it was like Iraq. 
and uh, she wore a press helmet, body armor, and she got shot and killed. Oh. And then another journalist went and she wore hijab and she walked around with no problems for years mm -hmm. filming and taking photos. And like the story and, and, and hostile environment courses will, will, will teach you this. They'll, they'll tell you this. They'll say, yeah, because they're looking for the journalists. And if, and if you're if you're an insurgent group, you do not like journalists. That's I, that's what got me. And we are doing a little bit of spoilers. I saw someone in the comments was like, oh, my God, spoilers. We spoiled the, the movie early on in the show. I'm going to do it again right spoiled. now. <laughs> Why in the fuck were they driving around where it said press on the van? It's like a target. It's like a just a bullet target. You don't want press coming up on you if you're doing some insurgency work. Like, Well, they're not. Do they, they weren't insurgents. And in, th in this regard, I'd say they were correct to write press. on. You think people. so? You Absolutely. think it was more of a bulletproof vest than a target? So if you're driving through conflict territory, you're probably better off marking your vehicle press or or actually what a lot of the journalists do because they're scumbags, they put red crosses on it. Mm. Far left activists do this all the time. And this is why these symbols become meaningless. And that's why often it's like, don't do anything because, you know, partly you're, you are correct, Ian. Uh, you'll see this at all these Antifa protests. They'll put red crosses on their arms. Clearly Antifa throwing bricks at cops with masks on. And then when the cops start fighting back, the, the Antifa journalist starts filming and then they go, oh, I'm a medic, please, please. Mm. And then they go, oh, the cops are attacking medics. Oh, all oh, fake. That's why the cops are like, you're not a journalist. You're not a medic. Move. Yeah. But they mm. fake it. Yeah, dude. It's like urban, urban warfare, man. Inception. All right. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, I saw Civil War, 7 out of 10, a movie named that should be about a civil war. I didn't get lost in the story or root for any of the characters. No lost in escapism. Trump's last quote was kind of funny. <laughs> it's funny that Raymond called him Trump. It was very <laughs> obviously Trump. But uh, uh, Nick Offerman said that he's definitely not Trump. Did he really he, say that? Yeah, he said, uh, I got the quote right here. He said, uh, honestly, no. When you see the movie, it's unattached to anything in modern politics, not only in our country, but any country. The opening <laughs> of the movie is Nick Offerman, and it's him practicing his lines going, we are on the verge of the greatest victory. Some say the greatest victory in military history. And it's like, yeah, okay. Like there's one president that says some said it was the greatest. That's like literally writing a Trump line. And then the, uh, uh, what is it? Like when, when that, that uh, Jesse Plemons scene from the, from the trailer where he's like, what kind of American are you? That was such a bait and switch. You like the, the insinuation is like, are you left? Are you right? Mm -hmm. Which side are you on? No, he goes, which, which kind of American are you? North American, Central, South American? And the guy goes, Florida. He goes, oh, okay. Like, oh, so he, what, he, he wasn't asking him. Like, mm -hmm. he's like, yeah, that's American. All right. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Prent M says, Tim, was there a reason I was forcibly subjected to an ad when your stream started? It's because YouTube runs ads on the show. I don't know. Nonpartisan Kitty says, give it to me the Bocus Beanie. Oh, yeah. Maybe we can make Bocus Beanies. Yes. <laughs> Seamus nice. is the new kid. All right. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, Tim, Team Western Front or Team U.S. Government? There's no heavy backstory, so we don't know for sure what's happening. Uh, one of the remarks, it, like so you, you learn some of the story when one of the journalists says, oh, you're going to ask the president questions. And then he starts asking questions that he wants the guy to ask. And one of them is, has your policy changed around using airstrikes on American citizens? And then he's like, that's what I'm talking about. And I'm like, like Barack Obama. Ah, so yeah. the good, you know, the switch. But but it's clearly Kinda. Trump. Yeah. And so the the insinuation, if, if I were to look at that film, the way everything breaks down, it is that Texas is on the verge of turning blue now. The, the uh, a, a year or a few years from now, there is an Antifa massacre, which escalates tensions. Donald Trump ends up winning uh, a third term, or, or he wins second term. And it, it is fair to say it's not Trump in the sense. Yeah, because it's film, 20 years in the future. The film has to be 20 years in the future. It has to be. Because she says you got your start because when you were in college, you got a picture of the Antifa massacre. So for the Antifa, so considering the Antifa massacre has not occurred, and if this is presumably in a comparable, like based on our timeline, then it would have to be at least a year from now or this year later on, which means Kirsten Dunst, who is 41 years old and presumably is 41 years old in the movie, was around the age of 20 to 24 at the time. So it's just about 20 years in the future. So which means it probably would not be Trump, but it would be 
next Trump or something. Yeah, it was, a, it was a someone sort who's of a, acting like it's Trump. It's a legacy. It's right. And so when I say it's Trump, you could fe- reasonably say it is MAGA. It's MAGA. It is the heir of MAGA who, after it gets elected, there's an Antifa massacre. They don't say if Antifa killed or was killed. They just call it the Antifa massacre. And then the, 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 the assumption is based on the narrative. Uh, a conflict happens. The president uses airstrikes to stop the conflict, which results in various factions forming and, you know, or it could be that like California secedes because he wins a third term. So then to try and seize control of the country, he airstrikes it, which results in other states seceding or something like that. Well, they know that Trump created the movement that is much bigger than him and they will survive him. That's why they targeted MAGA people, too. You know, with January 6th, they try to portray them as terrorists and then, uh, uh, you know, trying to delegitimize everything he represents and everyone who can potentially uh, bring his uh, legacy in the future. And that's to me makes completely sense that uh, they're targeting entire movements because he's the only president who created a movement, by the way. Who else? Juan Castle says, Hope ban all raccoons now. <laughs> Tim, get Elon Musk on IRL. Easier said than done. Um, but OK, I guess, you know, we'll work on it. Yeah, Elon, okay. uh, what I'm planning on doing is getting justice for Mr. Mutton Chops. You know, I'll tell you something weird. This morning when I w- rode my bike up to the studio, as I as I drive up to the front, I can see Mr. Mutton Chops has jumped out already. And I saw him standing next to the entrance uh, where the gate opens up and you can put him back in. And I thought to myself, as soon as I saw it, I was thinking like, he's going to die. I just like, that's exactly what hit my mind. And I, and I just ignored that feeling. Mm-hmm. And then I went inside. And then as soon as I finished my morning show, I got the message, he's dead. Wow. His, his feathers are scattered all across the lawn. We saw a fox out in the back. Mm. And so we will uh, appropriately... Seek justice in in whatever form, but uh, I'll I'll leave it at that. Justice, I think, would be to build a better a better city. I talked oh, well, to Kim ne- about Neo uh, Chicken City for yeah, with uh, a gazebo with like a, a roof, because then the rain won't get the poop nasty. Right, and, and we're, uh, we're we're the new and improved. Yeah, so this is uh, old Chicken City was the small one, and it's been de- it was destroyed a long time ago, and uh, this is actually new Chicken City. And it's got the established 2020. Mm-hmm. And so now what we're building is Neo Chicken City, which is going to be like Tokyo Futurism. What about it? And we're going to give all the chickens neon sunglasses. What about a Klux <laughs> Capacitor? That's a, it, it's a hilly. Oh. I, yeah. That's what Thomas Massey built, this giant contraption that moves with solar power throughout the day. And his chickens graze in new areas. All right. Let's read some more. The Engaged Few says they actually believe that West Virginia would remain loyal to the national government. Clearly, they've never looked at either West Virginia's history or populist political history. Uh, I disagree with you, sir. I believe that West Virginia absolutely would be a loyalist state, assuming Donald Trump was the president. See, that, that's the point. Take a look at that map. And it's like, I get it. New York's in there, too. But West Virginia certainly makes sense when you consider the president is Trump. And then uh, Texas seceding makes sense. California and the Pacific Northwest going Maoist. They, they explicitly say Maoist in the film. They say the Portland Maoists when they're referring to that faction in the Northwest. So it okay. sounds like it's it sounds like China aided the far left and they expanded through Minnesota and they seized all the territory. That's what it seems like. Um, but I would say this too, even if it was Joe Biden who was like the bad guy, you know, and, and, and it was the red states trying to secede, West Virginia would still be a loyalist state because it because of proximity to D.C. The, the military... Uh, capabilities in this area are insane. West Virginia ain't going nowhere. Yeah, and it's a it's a point that you would need to seize and take. Like Harper's Ferry is such a defensive bastion with the mountains and the rivers and a transportation network and stuff. Hmm. An authentic tin can says, Tim, look up the Hearts of Iron 4 mod, Kaiser Re- R- Reich's U.S. Civil War, and tell me you didn't don't see the similarities. I don't know what that is. You want to look that up? Our Hearts of Iron Four is a it's a paradox game, grand strategy game, World <laughs> War II game. I haven't. What's the mod? It's some like an American mod. Devin Porter says California, Texas make perfect sense. That's where they're storing most of the criminal aliens they've been shipping into the U.S. I I, I agree too. <laughs> uh, the 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 narrative is that within twenty years Texas goes blue, and then that's it. The Texas and California governments team up. But I liked their original where they each kind of split off on their own. Because yep. I think Texas would just go independent. They don't care about American politics. Yes, I mean, but not in 20 years. The mm. idea is that uh, there's an argument Texas is becoming more red because of the exodus from California. But it was fairly close before. And some people are saying it's becoming a purple state. The idea being that if all of these criminal aliens come in, California and Texas are both going to be blue. 
And then with 51% of the population, they will install in a supermajority of Democrats in the state. And uh, the president even refers to the subjugated people of Texas in the film. So yeah. it's it's possible that Texas is split in half. There is no wall yeah. on this border. Yep. Metaphorically and uh, physically. EV Man says, Tim, did you see David Hogg get absolutely wrecked by Lily Tang, uh, Tang Williams on the subject of gun control, Dragon Lady for the win? I was reading a bit about Spike and David Hogg's debate, and my understanding is that David Hogg won the debate. I'd like to see it. Is it available? Uh, it's about 80 minutes long. I didn't catch all of it. I just caught some excerpts. Um, I mean, it's like I said earlier, like uh, Spike has a bunch of graphs that the audience can't see. He's arguing data. And <laughs> at one point, the moderator is just like, okay, so after after Spike throws out all this data that's a little overwhelming, the moderator says, okay, so David, why are, do we have this problem in this country? He goes, because it's the guns. It's the guns and the guns, because we have guns. And then people in the audience agreed. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, know, I don't, I don't know much about it other than that someone said that the audience ended up siding with David Hogg. Well, I think Spike and David would be a good uh, duo on Culture War if David would like to come in, do I mean, a neutral panel and let them talk about it. I, I, I think the problem with the right and probably the reason David agreed to debate Spike is that David is better at manipulating people than Spike is. And so you end up with a guy showing charts and graphs and being like the data clearly shows that if we do this and then David Hogg goes and then they shot a baby. And the audience goes, oh, a baby. He goes, that's right, because of guns. And they go, whoa. It's like, did you know you can buy a gun? No. Yeah. <laughs> and guns kill babies. It's like a family guy joke where Lois is running for office. And she goes, nine, yeah. 11. And they go, oh, and they start screaming and cheering. Dude, like, what? The, the right, you know, Ben Shapiro says facts don't care about your feelings. And then everyone on the right starts hooting and hollering and running around the room, waving their arms around. <laughs> and the, and I, 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 f feelings don't care about your facts. And feelings mm -hmm. are easier to, to communicate to because facts are hard to understand. So they always say people will not remember what you what you told them or uh, the, what is it? What is it? What is it saying? People will remember what you say. They'll remember how you made them feel. feel yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when David Hogg makes you feel sad and scared. You'll end up checking off the box being like, yeah, he was right. I was scared. You saw some, was it that pedantic or did it actually, was he making great points? I, I don't want to speak out of turn or anything. I mean, he, I, like I said, I only saw a few excerpts because I wanted to cover it. Um, but I, like, I mean, I'm, I'm going to watch like 15 minutes out of 80 minutes. So I know there's a lot that I missed there, but no, I mean, I, I, the, the few excerpts that I saw basically just relied on the same structure, data graphs that perhaps the audience couldn't see. And Spike even acknowledged that he was just like, I know you guys can't see this. And then David Hogg would just resort to it's the guns. The guns are the problem. We have to we have to have major gun regulation in this country. Yeah, guns kills baby. What about abortions? I mean, they don't have the same feeling for that. Nope, hmm. they don't because you're taking away from them. So the, the issue with the left is they're thinking I want mine, and you're like guns could kill you. And they go oh, and they go and then we'll take away your abortion. They go, but then I have to be responsible. <laughs> what you need to say is that may be David, but did you know that when you buy a gun? You get free ice cream. And they go, what is that true? That's right. That's right. That, that's, that's, that's true. I and think, they'll go, wow, I think guns are great. <laughs> yeah, David's Did you like know a... that because of guns, we have pizza? Really? That's right. <laughs> See, the original pizza was invented when a guy was trying to make a gun, but accidentally used wheat instead of iron. And then rolled it out, put tomato sauce and cheese on it. And yeah, it was pizza. And they'll go, wow, that's right. So you have to respect it. I bet David... Because I think he's going to be a prolific voice for gun rights in the future, what, in whatever direction. <laughs> but like, that's gun why rights. I want to, yeah, and I want to talk to him now early on in his career because if, you know, reasonable, we need reason in this country. And being able to have reasonable conversations with people you disagree with is the important part I just be like, David, of is it because of guns that a guy pushed another guy in front of a train in New York? No. Is it because of guns that a guy punched a woman in the face in New York? No, is it because of guns that a guy scalded four people, four women and, and several other people in New York? Did you guys hear that one? Mm -hmm. A guy was taking happened? boiling water and throwing it in people's faces. Oh my so. God. Yeah, this was in March. I didn't even know it happened. It's like so much crime in New York. But, but guns are the problem. And it's like, I get that guns are like when there is a mass shooting incident. But like, that's like, you know, you live in this world where you think it's the biggest problem in the world when peanuts kill more people. Like, I don't think we're going to ban peanuts anytime and, and soon. And 3D printed guns, uh, if people can craft them in their homes, like trying to ban the information oh, I know. is it's insane. Scott, did Spike bring that up? 
He may have in the excerpts that I didn't see. Be like, like, if he's like, it's the guns, guns are the problem, I'd be like, probably, but they're 3D printed now, so you can't do anything about it, so good luck regulating it. It doesn't matter if mm. you're right or wrong. Mm. Debate's over. Cat's out of the bag. Mm-hmm. Guns can be 3D printed. 3D. You you can straight up make a fully fully uh, uh, 3D printed gun. Fully plastic. And, uh, plastic. And uh, well beyond the capabilities of Liberator, which was 10 years ago, pl- 10 plus years, uh, years ago. The videos they're putting out with this stuff is crazy. And now we're at the point where you have the 0% receiver. You get a metal block and you put in an at-home CNC machine and it carves it out for you. Like, you can't do anything about it. It's, it's ridiculous. And also, it's just like, David, you know, his problem is that he lives in 1940. Because you know what he should be talking about? Directed energy weapons. For real, man. Ballistics of all kinds. We should mm. go deep on weaponry. Thing. Rail That'd guns. Be awesome. Yeah. All right. We'll grab a couple more of these here. Super Chats. X Tin Man says the lefty writers screwed up when they named Alaska Polar Bear Cold State. They should have called it Polar Bears Dead due to global warming state. They uh, There's a scene where they breach the White House and there's a Secret Service agent who's unarmed and she's like, I'm here to negotiate. And then she was like, can you guarantee safe passage for the, passage for the president? And they're like, no. And then she's like, we want to go to neutral territory like Alaska. And then the female special forces of the West, uh, who's like doing this mission, just shoots and kills the negotiator. <laughs> like, it's like, okay, I guess. And then they just storm in, and yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's bad. Yeah. Dragon Wolf says, "Hey Tim, I'm a longtime Fallout fan. With how they snubbed New Vegas in the show, Bethesda may have permanently fractured the community. I am pissed, dude. I we, only watched the first episode. We could do a whole episode on Fallout at some point. I gotta watch it now. I gotta. Oh, know. I was ranting to Ian how they screwed up the I, first episode. I want to so be bad. in it. I want to be a scientist. I help me get to the producer if you know people that work for the company. I want to make that show the best show on earth. I want to help dude. them make a, a awesome, lush universe and play the role of a scientist nope. from Atomics, General Atomics from East Texas, who's like hangs out and he's got an energy weapon, dude, and he hangs out on with the crew. That'd be so bad. Badass. All right. Last one. Rabid Wino says, so options are let the government raise our kids or let the parents raise their kids. The government already rules us if we allow them to even be a choice. No. All right, everybody. If you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, head over to TimCast.com, click join us because the members only show is coming up in just a few minutes and it's going to get not family friendly. Yeah, you're not going to. Yeah, this one's going to be gross. <laughs> so uh, you can follow the show at Timcast IRL. You can follow me personally at Timcast. Uh, Simona, do you want to shout anything out? Well, uh, if follow me on my ex account, uh, Simona Mangiante, and Instagram. The same, but with two underscores. So follow my content and uh, great to be on the show, team. Thank you so much for all of you. And we have an incredible singer as well. So Oh, yeah, we were playing... Yeah, um, Welcome to your life. That's Amazing. great. Yeah, I was playing on the guitar. Right? I don't follow, just not to <laughs> get everybody off the show. <laughs> but I love the song. You should it's keep so going. Good. And it's uh... Uh, Chris Carr seventeen on X. Be sure to check out SCNR Scanner News for all of your news junkie needs. Everybody wants to. Did you mute me, Serge? Or did I? No. Did, did my, my audio just cut out? No, I'm sorry. That's You're paranoid. Uh, it's a great song. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Thanks for putting up with everything. And Simona, it was really good to meet you, man. That was an awesome show. Chris, Thank it's you. wonderful to see you again, dude. Always a pleasure. Hope I get to see you on the weekly as a regular thing. Really good to see you. Uh, Tim, thanks for inviting me to the movie today. That it was, was fun. Cool. That was wild. Yeah. Serge. It was a work thing. You know, I was like, I, I was like, and you got to watch it. We yeah, got to watch it yeah. for the culture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the culture, indeed. It was an interesting film. Thanks for taking me, Tim. Uh, see you guys later. We'll see you all over at TimCast.com. Thanks for hanging out.